Iran, Russia, China, North Korea, ISIS, Al-Qaeda. They may be watching this right now. Our military should not be mistaken for our cable news gab fest show. We don't care what you look like. We don't care who you voted for. Who you worship, what you worship, who you love. It doesn't matter if your dad left you millions when he died or if you knew who your father was. We have been honed into a machine of lethal moving parts that you would be wise to avoid if you know what's good for you. We will not be intimidated. We will not back down. We've seen war. We don't want war. But if you want war with the United States of America, there's one thing I can promise you, so help me God. Someone else will raise your sons and daughters. I want to make it clear that the views expressed by our hosts are not considered the official stance of MBR views. Remember, this is all about having fun and enjoying the ride. Welcome to the Pit Stop Podcast. We are proudly hosted on MBR, the only station giving veterans a voice. And thank you for listening to us. Great weekend, guys. Great, great weekend. Back-to-back wins for AMG Patronus. Lewis Hamilton getting his. Unfortunately, not the greatest weekend for George Russell. Uh, had to fall out with a mechanical failure. Um, but a good week, a good British Grand Prix for the Brits. Uh, qualifying one through three. That was pretty cool to see. A lot of good, exciting racing. Jay's probably not as happy as I think he would ordinarily be, given Max uh, kind of being defenseless. We'll go ahead and jump into that later. But uh, what are you guys' thoughts on this weekend? We'll go ahead and start with you, Greg. What did you think about the British GP? Holy moly. Uh, we're going to get into this, but it looks like the regulations are working as intended. Viewers are getting what they want. And... We got highs and lows and like we all have our favorites, but they can't always win. And this weekend was, I think, a classic example of that. Like there's just there's so many storylines. We need more than an hour. We need more than an hour. That's what I'm that's what I'm leaving it on. There we go. Done. For once, I will agree with Greg over over here. Um, <laughs> so a water system issue. Are you absolutely kidding me? Like th- that, that's literally what you're going to go out with, especially that late in the race. Cause he went out at what, four, lap 40 or so? It was pretty late. Like, yeah, there was only le- less than 15 laps left for him. So, yeah, it was probably, yeah, between yeah I think 40 it was like lap 36 to yeah. 40, somewhere in there. You but, think they'd want to like, push it a little bit? Really? Yeah. I- I'll leave off my tinfoil hat today. But uh, <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I, I'm i not going to lie. I thought about it, too. I thought, like, hey, is this them kind of giving it to us? But, hey, Lewis did pass on his own, too, and yeah. take the lead. And yeah. he was and already up front. fighting him at that time. Yeah, he was He was in the lead. So I, I don't oh, think I that don't they really, really sabotaged their points. They are still trying to chase up into the constructors. And, and mm-hmm. you know, they look like they have a good shot to take the top three now. Um, especially with the woes of Ferrari. And that's something, you know, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit because they are struggling and heads are going to roll in that organization. Uh, we just saw one retirement mm-hmm. possibly or separation after a 20 year tenure. Um, so yeah, again, remember this is the team that fired their team principal for placing second. <laughs> they do not like to lose. Well, I mean, they've been doing it for almost 20 years now. You figure they'd be used to it. A little too a little too much. So, uh, so Lando, Lando, Lando drove. Yeah, Lando drove uh, very, very well this weekend. 
We also saw like good, clean racing out of both him and Verstappen. I kind of wonder if there was some conversations behind the scene between them and the FIA of like, hey, watch yourselves because we, we are going to be very strict on penalties. Um, would be interesting. And yes, that was Enrico Cardile who was leaving as a chassis designer at Ferrari for over 20 years now. We talked about this, though. 20 years is a long time to be doing anything, um, especially yeah. in the sport of F1. And it, it, just like I speculate with Nui and, and some of these other drivers, is you know, they might just be tired. It's a long year. Indeed. And now the question is, does this open up a spot for Nui at Ferrari? Hmm. All kind of wonder it is. I mean, it, it's not a bad rumor to start. Uh, I also think it's a lot of like what it is, would be at the forefront of people's minds. Uh, I'm, I was talking offline with uh, we will be having our guest next week, Fabian from F1 Fans of America. And so he his immediate thought was is the same as mine. Is this cutting cap space open for, for new to go? I mean, that was a rumor. Hamilton kind of smiled when they asked him about it. Uh, he was being very coy. Uh, when he was questioned about it. So it wouldn't surprise me. It would be pretty neat. I mean, again, Ferrari has some of the highest standards of, of any team in sports. And uh, yeah, it would not surprise me to see them chasing and going all out, trying to get a championship and put themselves back in the front. So if I remember correctly, that engineer, is, like you said, has been there forever, was a Benito fanboy like hardcore and this is the last of benito's crew that was there vachira's newest upgrade packages are not working and they have his name on them not benito anymore so you got to start wondering mm. on the, the newy thing aston martin they opened their checkbook and said pick what you want to make you'll be one of our top three we don't care You've been saying it all along, Rich, with that Saudi money. They really don't care. They want that winning car. They already have Alonzo. They have room temperature IQ, which I'll be interested to see what he does with a Honda engine and a Nui car. I really will be interested because Nui can fine-tune those cars to a driver. And they're not going to tune it to uh, Fernando. It's just that simple. They want somebody scrappy that will get up there whenever Stroll is just going on his walkabout. But I I would not put it out of the realm that Ferrari's already out the window. I don't I got, think they'll have enough of the top three, which don't count against Cap, to hire Nui. I got a steamer to follow Jay. What about this? Nui helps... Uh, Stroll comes over to Aston Martin and helps Stroll buy Red Bull Visa card, whatever the fuck the other team's name is. And then he's got some of his own like fam in house. And now Stroll's like taking over the world. And then we'll forget all about room temperature IQ because we'll be thinking about, oh my gosh, now we got four cars all funded by the sound. This would be so much money. And it's just pure domination. And then all of a sudden Horner's over there making more sad faces on the stream every week where he's just like, huh. That's not in the script that I wrote. Sending pictures of his thumb out to everybody. Speaking really of scripts that thumb. you didn't write, and Christian Horner, uh, how bad is he kicking himself right now for his contract decision making in RB? Well, not necessarily him, but is the team. How mad is he right now about the decision? Because you you are forgetting key another points week. of that contract. What? doing again like so not bad kicking himself again I'll, I'll switch it and make it to what is accurate how mad is and upset is he about this contract choice now because his, yeah his can't face be happy his face on the feed jay what did his face say when checko went off in qualifying this what motherfucker was, what was going again, face? this motherfucker again is all it was now there has been some very interesting comments coming out of the Red Bull camp about Checo's contract and why um, Will Buxton said what he said at FP2. There is a clause in Checo's contract where if he is beyond 100 points of max at the start of the summer break, 
that contract and all contracts are null and void. So at Red Bull's discretion, hold on, let me I'm going that. to look up the at points Red right Bulls, now. He is 136 points behind Max as it stands with two races to go before summer I'm not break. Great with math, but that's that's bad. Uh huh. Now, 136 stipula- is more than 100. Yes, that stipulation was written in especially for this upcoming contract. Now, we mentioned last week that all Red Bull drivers, including B-Carb, Red Bull, whatever, are Red Bull drivers, simply put. That means Checo can go be a reserve over at V-Carb. Liam Lawson takes Daniel Ricardo's seat. Or Ricardo takes Perez's seat, just like I said a few weeks ago, whenever I was going off and saying, let's get Danny Rick in that car. Let's see what he can do. Yep. If he is washed up and has been and cannot keep up with Max, done. You have your loss and seat at that point. Move Yuki. Let the record up. show. Let's go. You wanted to move Yuki up, but Yuki, you know, he's got that Honda money. So he's probably well, no. not going to take that time spot. I said for this year, at the summer break, to put Ricardo into yep. that seat. So that way you can test both drivers to see if Daniel Ricardo is still cut out to be in F1, you will have your answer by the end of the year. At that point, you and as we've two talked seats. about, yep. And as we've we've talked about previously, uh, you know, driver motivation and concentration, focus, you know, the, the mental acuity that it takes, like that has to be there. Um, I think DR3 has all of that motivation in the world right now. He wants that top seat. He would step in and give it his all, and we would see what does he have left. And it does put them in a very favorable position when it comes to negotiating and finding drivers as to, like, okay, well, who do we want to choose? And what a luxury for Red Bull to be able to choose between four really exceptional drivers minus one performing like he's worse than Logan Sargent. And so let's give him credit where credit was due. He uh, qualified very well and probably had one of his better performances in F1 this this past weekend. I know Silverstone's a Williams track, um, but he, he looked comfortable in the car and he, he looked like he was, you know, trying to be there this weekend versus in the in the previous weekends where, and again, not always necessarily his fault. He's not getting the, the right upgrades on his car. He's not driving the best car they have. He's sometimes it's it's just testing, you know, for them. And it's not, you know, we, we can't expect him to be pushing and scoring points. But at the same time, we also don't want to see him driving the car off the track on his own will. I find him very refreshing on the microphone for an unfortunate reason. He doesn't sound like he expects to win. He doesn't have that, like, that killer instinct where he's like, oh, yeah, I, it's just a shame I didn't win this week. Like, he comes on radio. He's like, hey, guys, I do anything wrong there. How's that? Uh, how's that lap looking? You want me to do something different? Like he is one hundred percent just being a team player because I think he understands. Probably doesn't have a seat next year, and he's not even like bitter about it up front. He doesn't seem to be like upset. He's just like, yeah, cool, man. Like I kind of look forward to see what he does next. If he goes Andy Car, he goes Weck or whatever, and to see how his his driving career goes forth. Because there's a lot of people that have come from, say, like Red Bull camp, especially like Scott Speed and um, oh, what's that other guy's name? But anyway, there's Splash and Boemi and one of the other gents that are on Weck now, and like they do great. They have phenomenal racing careers. Mm-hmm. They're very, you know, well, well adjusted and do, doing good. I, I, I have well, I quite similarly best. with like Mick, Mick Schumacher. You know, uh, just didn't didn't get. I mean, he got a shot, but it wasn't like the greatest shot or the greatest landing position for him. And so, unfortunately for Logan in his career in F one, he just landed at the worst possible team at the worst possible time, and just couldn't get his feet underneath him. Um, and yeah, I feel awful for him because. He's struggled and sacrificed his entire life to get here. Um, and it just sucks that it went so abysmally. But you're absolutely right. It would be nice to see him in, in any car or, or endurance championships. Uh, I mean, that's where Mick landed and he's doing quite well. So yeah, there there will be he'll be driving somewhere, just probably not on the grid next year. So you guys ready for this? He is no longer in last yeah. place. That's great. Tell us more. Botas is currently in last place. Oh, but he's, I hate seeing know. it. But here's the thing. And I know me and you have had this discussion numerous times, Rich. 
Logan Sargent literally got pulled out of F, uh, F3 and brought into F1. He didn't get the chance to develop. He did not have the time. Now, fun facts, he is going to IndyCar next year from all rumors. So he'll be down there with the Phoenix. So let's see what he can do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I figured you would like that one, Greg. So, yeah, no, um, the field's getting pretty tight. Or it's getting a lot tighter. The fact that Albon's only four points ahead of him right now and three places says a lot about what Sargent is doing in that car right now. Yes, yeah, he like may not year. be. Yeah, he may not be doing like setting the world on fire, getting points, anything like that. But he is keeping up with his teammate, which is what is expected of him. He is yeah. still a last very year. young driver. That car had an exploitable difference in top speed. Like it was impossible to get past that thing in a DRS train. And Albon knew how to deal with that. And he was making moves and, you know, make, getting a lot of points with it. This year, it's a probably an easier car to drive. It's probably more well-rounded, but it's not doing them any favors. And perhaps this is their step to like, hey, we got to like get away from just being a top speed car so we can actually build some lap time elsewhere. But the field is so dense now. And this is something that I didn't put any of our notes or anything. I just want to bring up. They showed the gap at some of the prior races at, at the Silverstone GP. Huge, whole laps separating. Like, yeah, we got people that got lapped this year, but it was because of the crazy conditions. The field is insanely tight. And that's when I'm, I want to get into the regulations at some point, Rich, and talk about how this is working. Like, we are getting what we paid for when we said, I'm going to pay for F1 this year, and I don't want to watch some cars actually battle because this is what we're seeing. Definitely a good summer break topic. Um, Jay, we're going to go ahead and kick it over to you because we're going to talk about Max's poor weekend. Um, I, I you know, actually, that's a little harsh. Just I was going to say, second place is now a poor his, weekend. <laughs> poor <laughs> comparative to his normal performances, but that's where we're at now, right? Uh, like him not winning is is a bad weekend. Um, also, too, he probably would have been in third. Uh, because if Russell hadn't gone out, I think he could have been up there. Russell's, but his streak got broken. Point. So. What what is the streak? So the streak was he had not gone two consecutive weekends without winning a race in how long? It was like eight hundred days or something, or something like, like that. that. Yeah, eight hundred days, like insane streak that he had going. Um, no, that streak broken. is longer though. Lewis has been on the podium at every Silverstone GP since the Crustaceous period. Like it's absurd how well that guy does at that track. It's, and uh, he is the absolute king of Silverstone. Uh, undeniable. Nine wins at one track. Broke a Schumacher record uh, that he had tied. Um, yeah, we're getting comments. 726 days. So he went oh, okay. 726 days without a consecutive losing weekend. Um, well, was Schumacher then like first. 785? I'm not sure. Yeah, I can't remember. I know Schumacher holds the record, but I can't remember how long it was. But, yeah, no. I mean, at the beginning of the race, it almost looked like Max was giving the FIA the finger and being like, fine, you don't want me to fucking drive? You don't want me to fight? Here's how boring it's going to be. Congratulations. Let's go. Ah, like, I got it, a different theory on really that. felt like that. Either that or the way that he got back in Lando's good graces was, is... You're not allowed to fight anybody this weekend, mm. Max. That's it. If you can go one weekend without fighting with people, Penelope will be happy <laughs> because I'll be coming back for tea parties. <laughs> I he, like did, it. he did. He like, did. Uh, he did seem to, and I, I wondered that when I saw it too, because that was a very brisk and easy pass for Lando on him, and he, he kind of did just wave him by, and it it was kind of like, all right, there, there you go, guy. Like, yeah, we're we're good here, you know. Um, like smooth things over type of thing. Uh, I do again want to compliment him on his maturity and, and just the way that he did handle that in the public facing, uh, you know, to the media and everybody else, especially because those guys are such good friends off the track. Uh, one thing that came up though, um, in between our last episode and then, and I was going back and watching it, Lando made the call to not go back out from the pits. He said specifically, uh, no, retire the car, retire the car. We're not going to be in the points, and so we're not going to waste the mileage. And it was like, well, dude, I didn't see the extent of the damage to his front wing. 
And so I, I don't know if there was so much arrow damage that he couldn't have gone back out and, and pushed and at least placed in the top 10 and got some points out of it, or if he was just so frustrated that he he had to back off. Um, that point, I would probably criticize him as a driver and say, like, hey, man, you that's not an option, and you don't make that call. Like, that's a team principal decision, not you. And so somebody needs to put him back in line and say, like, no, dude, you do not make the decision to retire the car if the car doesn't need to be retired. I disagree with that completely. Because if you remember correctly, his tire actually was flapping on, like, Max's. So, A, you have a whole bunch of floor damage on that backside. You have a whole bunch of diffuser damage back there. You're already going to be looking at losing uh, downforce right there. The front wing had damage to it. We don't know the extent of the rim if it might have fused like both houses did a couple of years ago. So, I mean, there's a lot. But as far as if a Nicky Lauda, perfect example, retired the car himself. I am not comfortable driving this car. I do not feel safe. I'm retiring the car. Lost the world championship because of that. But he was absolutely right. Like, not even a joke. If a driver cannot tell you Different when it's time to retire to me, that but car, yes. but mm-hmm. if a driver can't tell, like, they're the ones that are risking their life. They are the ones that can feel if something is even a minutia wrong in that car. And you're telling them that you do not get that decision. We will make that for your life. I would I hear I hear exactly what you're saying. Like I said, I, did, I didn't know the, didn't know the extent of damage. And and you are absolutely right. It the driver does need to have it if it's unsafe. And if it was pull, pulling him out, and maybe that was the thing. He was so frustrated trying to trying to do defense and attack on it that he's just like, I know I'm not going to get this, and I know my concentration's so out now that this is dangerous for me now. Um, and so Plus he knew yes, he had I do agree with you wholeheartedly that that should always be left up to the driver. We're going to go ahead and take a quick commercial break, and when we come back, we'll get we'll actually talk a little bit more about Red Bull and what's going on there. All right. Thank you. The fact that uh, our patriotism in America is dwindling, I really wanted to start the American AF movement. Freedom is fragile, very fragile. It takes a certain level of intestinal fortitude to stand up and say and do the right thing to preserve the freedoms that so many have paid a large price for about being in the military and that recruiter said, it's not Biden's army, it's your army, it's his army, it's his army, it's it's all of our army. American tactical, American as f- Opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent. Find us on the web at mbradio.us. So one last point on your what you were saying, Rich, before the break. You got to remember, he also had that penalty that he got told about after he wrecked. At that point, mm-hmm. they can't even touch that car to adjust it for five seconds. So you're losing five seconds for that, 10 seconds for the wing, and five, or two to three seconds for the tires, depending how it is. So you're already up to 18 seconds back. You already limped in. Max stayed in front of you the whole way. Questionably stayed in front of you the whole way. I would be pissed off too. I would be like, get me out of this car before I do something freaking stupid. It's smart. Um, you know, some of some of there's uh some of that was, you know, frustration, you know, maybe a little bit of maturity, but at the same time, I I completely agree with you where it is up to his discretion. And so maybe a little bit harsh. I, the only thing I want to object to is like, if that's all it is, is just like your attitude or like a bad projection, because there's data that can be seen outside of the car as well is, is inside the car. I don't know. It just seemed like a, a little bit of a short sighted decision, but it, it should not ever controvert safety. So I think, you know, me, I like safety. What else did you think about Red Bull's weekend, man? Um, besides Checo, just you mean Max? Being... You you might as well just say Max at this point, like at least for the past what 
14 months, give or take. Because the last good race that Checo really had was Mexico, or not Mexico, Miami. He barely limped into second place. And that was last no, year. No, they started this out one, they started out, podium. they started out one, two this year. Yeah, but I'm saying like he didn't, he hasn't won. Everybody's like screaming, oh, this is the best car ever, blah, 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 blah. Yes, not even going to disagree. But it's like if the country has human rights, he can't perform there. So, like, everybody wants to say he is the street circuit god. I've yet to see anything. I mean, Monaco, it doesn't get much more street circuit than that. And you remember those old cartoons where the wheels fell off and the pit kept on going? That's kind of what it felt like with that one. Ouch. Ouch. Yeah. Deny it, though, Greg. There's no, no, no. You're, good. You're good. No, You're it, good. It's, it's just an excellent point to make. But, yeah, it, thank you. I love the humor and levity you inject. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, this was part of why he got re-signed was because he did start out the season doing his job. Going one and two with Max is his job. Nobody expects him to beat Max. Granted, there was a mechanical failure for Max where Checo probably should have been in first place, right? But he wasn't. So if if your teammate's out and you're in the best car, or the second best car on the grid, supposedly, which we've seen now, it was not. McLaren seems to have the best cars on the grid. Um, yeah, we expect you to win. Uh, also, they pay him a ridiculous amount of money to perform, and you're on the number one team, dude, with all of the resources at your disposal. So, yeah, it's it's, it's not great seeing this like absolute failure after he signed that contract. I don't know what's going through his head. Um, but definitely the pressure's on. We're talking about Red Bull? Yeah. I think yeah. what we're seeing here is their their decision about how much money to spend on this season versus development for next season. Like, this is, this is the budget cap doing what it's supposed to do, bringing down the highest paid teams and trying to bring up the lowest paid teams. And I think it's working really well at the top of the grid. Like, the midfield teams are seeing a bump. Aston Martin was hugely resurgent. They obviously need to spend some more. Ferrari has been back in the, the, the talking mix, and they're you know perhaps dealing with some people moving here and there and they're not hitting their strategies correctly now. McLaren is certainly the at, at least the second fastest car, arguably maybe the fastest car. Maybe they just haven't hit their their calls right. They don't maybe they don't have a Max Verstappen at the wheel, but they definitely have two very fast guys at the wheel. And then of course Mercedes is still in the mix too. I think Red Bull and Max are doing what they can to deal with the car that they currently have. And the car seems to not like so soft tires because he hasn't qualified perfect, which now we have to say, if Mac doesn't do perfect, then obviously his weekend is shot. Like, oh my gosh, you know, he had to have an adult in the, the cool down room because he didn't do good enough to keep the, you know, the kids from, from overrunning everybody. I think this is great. This is exactly, I would rather see Max battle through. And my conspiracy theory is that he purposely went soft and qualified and a bigger challenge towards the end of the day. And he let Lando go and he was like, watch this kid. I'm gonna get you. I'll let you six seconds out. I'm gonna reel your ass in, and he almost he almost got handy at the end. Although I will I will say that Hamilton drove very maturely, knew exactly that he was gonna try and let Lando blow his tires off before he responded. Lap 49, he set his PB, kept them at bay, had nothing to worry about with Max. Still entertaining as all holy hell. So here is my thing with this: the whole tire situation. Is that what Nui was talking about a couple of months ago? Whenever he's like, there's one thing I hate about this car, and it is one major weakness. Is it the soft tires? Because those hards were going better than the softs and the mediums on that Red Bull. He was annihilating things. And whenever he pulled up, those tires were not grained at all. Yeah. He also was able to come up to speed without pressure from someone coming out of the pit. So I think. Mercedes did the right thing by putting Hammy on softs because they were like, we got to come out of the pits. We're undercutting. We need first lap performance. And of course, Lando needed first lap performance because he was being undercut. I think those two had to do that. Max, that car works great on hards. He was coming like a freight train. This is quality, quality TV here. Honestly, if the rain would have ended I two laps sooner, Max would have had his ass. As much as he was Probably. gaining per lap, he was down to 1.7 seconds from six, I think it was, like five laps back. Yeah, like, so I, I knew you were going to bring this up. I knew it. Oh, Jay's at home writing down the, the numbers, but the, the gap that Lando had was the gap 
that Max ended up with until the last lap. And then Lewis let him take like a second and a half out of it. And I, I, I watched the lap times and like, it looks like he just went real safe on that last lap to not like, he wasn't rotating the car coming out of apexes. He was just rolling oh, yeah. through and letting it go. I, I really think that was a managed gap, but Max was not letting up. And that's what we want to see. We want to see someone who's like, I can do this. I'm going to put my head down and freaking go for it. And without having Toto come over the radio and be like, by the way, you might be able to win this, you know, like just everybody calm down. Like we got professionals behind the wheel here. Right. Um, so now here, here's my, my big question for you at this point is Lewis regretting his decision to go to Ferrari. Is he begging Toto enact my second of the one plus one right now? Please do it. He's going to get paid. He's going to get paid big time at Mercedes, at Ferrari. This is career stuff, right? He can put on the red suit and be like, check it out. Now I'm a clown too. Hopefully that does not what happen. <laughs> I hope it does personally because I hate Ferrari. So, I mean, but well, I wouldn't no, be surprised if he. I hate what Ferrari did to signs. I really hate what they did to signs. Signs is like, oh, yeah. Watch me screw up the whole driver's market. <laughs> yeah. I uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he was second-guessing his choice now, just based off of the the lack of performance from Ferrari this year and the struggles that they're having. Um, you know, it's, it's always some kind of silly little mistake, and it's usually not a driver mistake. It's, it's on the team. Um, what did you guys think about McLaren? And like, this is why, like, Verstappen is perfect nearly every time, and Red Bull as a team is perfect nearly every time. They had a, a end of like end of race slower pit stop than they should have, but McLaren botched it completely, not bringing Oscar right in after Lando, and like several decisions that they have made have cost Lando a place ahead of Max. So that's getting frustrating to see. It's got to be frustrating for Lando. Jay, I know you've got strong opinions. Give me a second. But it, it cost Oscar the most, I think, this weekend. And it's cost him the most throughout this year. And that's one of the more frustrating things to see is because Oscar and Lando are very evenly matched um, when it comes to driving. And you could probably rotate strategy-wise either one of them as the lead or put Oscar in the faster car and I think he would beat Lando. So that's going to be some drama that I think we're going to see play out through the rest of the season. And, and even, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody tried to steal Oscar from McLaren at some point. Because if they could give him a, a good enough offer, like if Red Bull came at Oscar and was like, hey, man, you, you want to be our number two? We'll, we'll get you wins. We will put you on a podium. I uh, I mean, they could they could probably entice him and make something convincing towards him. But I, I'm curious to see how Oscar's frustrations play out. Again, we've talked about just his stoic nature and the way he handles things. He's you know wise beyond his years, seemingly in his maturity. He does not um, like lash out or throw any kind of tantrums. He's yeah, very very reserved and calm. But eventually, he's going to realize, hey, you know what? I'm I'm one of the the top three drivers on this grid right now and you put me in a good car i can win this too um but yeah what do, what do you have to think about mclaren and what they're doing over there jay so for starters i will say them not pitting oscar right after lando was stupid i understand that they were trying to test it out split the strategy see if it was keeping one car in the lead because no matter what they did one car was staying in the lead now i will say McLaren screwed up in the fact that they put Lando on the softs. That car is a monster on the mediums. Like every time that Lando has challenged Max, it has always been on the mediums. So why not put him back on the mediums? Third, he missed his he missed his spot. In that long pit stop that Lando had, he missed his spot by yeah. He seriously was off his marks by at least a good foot and a half, two feet. Like, they were dragging the tire down. Um, so, realistically, it was uh, it was a team screw-up, if you will. Um, as far as 
everything else goes, I think Lando was primed to win, but he honestly had too many things pop up in that race. I think they pitted for uh, intermediates at the right time. I think they pitted for slicks at the right time. But he couldn't take advantage of it. I think they put him on the wrong tires, him missing his box, and the Oscar getting split off from him is a big thing. Now, an interesting point to what you said about Oscar, Oscar's already proven he ain't got no loyalty to no team. Because if you remember correctly, Alpine brought him up. Like, they've sponsored him through all the series, everything like that. And he's like, nope, bye. I don't want to be here. Yeah, but who would be loyal to them? Who's he? Yeah. Dodged a bullet on that one, too. Oh, he definitely dodged yeah, a seriously. bullet. But the thing is, is like... Brilliant, brilliant move on his part. Yeah. Look at Max with Helmet is really all I got to say. He is absolutely loyal to the person that brought him in. Yeah, I think his dad has part, part to do that too, being such a close piece of the Formula One like history over the years. I think there was definitely a lot of, of like what not to do. <laughs> he also was okay in his day, right? <laughs> that, no, that hurt that. no, he was not. He was okay. That's like saying he Christian Horner it. deserved a shot at actually a good car. Well, okay. So or Ralph were, Schumacher was a decent widespread Schumacher. Widespread back in the day. Schumacher, Ralph was okay. Okay, if like, you're saying Ralph okay and Yost drivers. are both okay, I think we need to redefine your, your okay. <laughs> the only thing that Yost was good at was spinning down the road like this. <laughs> like, I wouldn't have All put right, him in the right. heritage thing. All right, wait. I, we got pertinent stuff to talk about here. We, we could argue okay, about Yost sorry. all day long. Guy's a maniac. Here's my thing. There's, there's I, a lot of the drivers teach. were calling yeah. for softs. Yeah, those who couldn't teach exactly. He was, he's definitely making up for his shortcomings in F1 by by basically child endangering Max's life. Anyway, so everybody was calling for softs. I think that was one of those things where it was cold out. People were wearing winter jackets and stuff the day before. So perhaps they were worried, that, you know, in the McLaren pits and the Mercedes pits are like, you know, we can run on these softs. We know we can go the distance. The question is, will Max catch us? And since they were over worried about over and undercut, I think that's why they went soft. They were like, this track is, there's no rubber on this track anymore. Like we're all offline and, you know, there's no temperature in it. That's my guess on the softs. Um, for uh, McLaren definitely missed the boat. If they had well, just double They stacked, gave them the option. They, they, yep. they were talking about it before. Do we go on softs and try and push with Lewis or, or do we try to defend? Um, and they went with the softs. But like, if you're presented yeah. that option and you have maybe three seconds to decide, well, yeah, I'm going to push for Lewis. You know, you're not in the mindset of like, right. oh, maybe the hards will be a little bit better. If if you're, if the call is that way, I'm then yes, right. I'm going to push for Lewis. What are you? What are you saying? And here's the thing: Lando if they Norris. had just double stacked, if they just double stacked, um, Piastri Oscar. couldn't remember his name all of a sudden. Yep. If they just Oscar the Grouch, yeah. If they just double stacked Oscar. That would have put Oscar on the back of Max. He would have been in front of signs in the stack as down going like after the pit stops run through. Now Max has someone in his rear view who's storming at him, who's already was already chasing him down. And now Max isn't going to attack Lando. Like that sets the stage up. They rolled the dice and Oscar definitely got the short end of the stick and still put the right tires on after losing an entire lap. But he got passed on the lap that his teammate pitted. Like that's unheard of. Like, but that's these conditions. Yeah. Maybe Bernie was right. Maybe we just need sprinklers at all the tracks because this is always what we say is the best race. Wasn't that what I said about Monaco? We need to like add water. We just no, we add just water so we can make track more interesting. In water. Just polish some of the corners, just real smooth. I think I we think if we spray some Monaco water, in the sea. spray some water down, we it would make it a, a more interesting race. But yeah, hopefully something changes because that was the worst thing I've seen all year. Can we talk? Oh, we're gonna get ready. Go ahead and take losers. another break. We are. Let's go ahead and jump in. Biggest winners, biggest losers after the break, and then we will come back with our recurring segment of "We were right, we were wrong." We're never wrong. Never wrong. We just weren't right yet. Yeah. Not many. Not many times so far. Uh, our producer is off camera, so let me see if I can do this myself. Do it. Keep talking. Okay. So we got Fabio in the uh, in the yep. comment section here, and dude is dropping knowledge here. 
Yes, 2026 20, regs are going to be adding on to 20, whatever, 20, 21 regs. When do we change? No, the 20, Hopefully, the 22 regs are gone. Right. They are gone. Yeah. Yeah. All arrow is pretty much destroyed at this point. Um, And as far as Lewis breaking the Schumacher record in the red, I don't the ultimate see disc. it happening. It could. At all. No. Ferrari goes in waves. They're just in a down wave right now. And signs Ferrari's still. Ferrari's been in a down wave for still... 20 years. Dude, they've been winning. Where have who? Where have you been? For, Red Bull's just been when really was the great. Last, when was the last time they actually challenged for a title without cheating? To be fair, Vettel didn't know they were cheating, and Alonso was right there. That could have gone his way too. So two thousand and eight. They were, they been, that makes it sound like a long time ago. The truth is, even in these regs, they've been relevant. They have won races. We have said Ferrari's the better team. Red Bull is missing, you know, the second driver. And here we are. It didn't really work out that way. But it was just a couple clown shows away from being a reasonable deal. Like, we we are holding Ferrari to a standard from Michael Schumacher's days. Those days were long gone, right? We need to see them as a good podium team that just, you know. Yeah, they're third it. best. Congratulations. Right now they're fourth best. Yeah, they're going in the wrong direction. But that's what I'm saying. It's a low right now, right? You put you leave Leclerc in the car. He's awesome. He just needs to be there on a high, and he can get a championship. He totally can. He Jim makes some Leclerc. mistakes, but you know that's part of his greatness. Many people Chuck can. Boy Let's go ahead and depressed. we will wrap. We will when we get close to wrapping the episode. We will talk about who our driver rankings. We'll just do top ten out of twenty. But uh, go ahead and take a quick commercial break. We will be right back with you.
expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent. Find us on the web at mbradio.us. Hello oh. and welcome back to the Pit Stop Podcast. We're going to go ahead and rearrange ourselves a little bit. Uh, we got a little mixed up there on there the screen. Go. There we go. Now I can see Greg again. Yay. Hey, 311. What's uh, up? Mm -hmm. Fun, absolutely random fact, but 311 has a bar in Omaha called The Hive, and they open at 3.11 p.m. every day. Not anymore? It's gone? I haven't lived there since, uh, like, 2014. Something else. Something else. Anyway, moving on. There used to be, there used to be a bar in Omaha called The Hive. It was awesome, Rich. and it opened at 3.11 p.m. every day. Never mind. <laughs> so... Before we were talking about uh, Rebel Struggle, we actually said we're going to get into We Were Right, We Were Wrong. Yeah, Jay and I were both I right. I love this part. If, if Lewis, <laughs> yeah, if Lewis won this year, Jay called this, if Lewis won this year, uh, it was going to be at Silverstone. And I predicted that Mercedes would have a good week at Silverstone and half right, right. I mean, as best as it could have been for Lewis. Honestly, just love love seeing him get a good win in, and it, especially there, uh, you saw just the pure raw emotion from him with his family afterwards. You roll your eyes all you want to, man, but like this guy did not have an easy path into the sport. You know, he, he faced a lot of issues and discrimination, a lot of bullshit that he didn't deserve, and it, it takes a certain kind of person to be that away from through him. all of that. And so, you know, karma catches up sometimes. And in this way, you know, his success may be reflective of all the nonsense that he has had to endure throughout his life. <laughs> look, at the, look at the comment section. That's great. Oh, right, listen, let me, let me, okay, let me so, drop something here. I was going to say, Lewis crying, a little cringe, but it does show he's <laughs> super passionate. He loves his fans, and I love that. I think the guy is actually a rock star. We just caught him in this weird early period of his professional career where he's like being a racing driver. Watch. He's going to drop an album when he gets out of this. He's really he is going has. to. Oh, was it like Shaq's album? Because that didn't go No, well. he doesn't go by Lewis Hamilton, so he doesn't get recognized for his F1 shit. Oh, you got to put this in the chat. Find me a link. Find me a link. Because if it was Alonzo that won, he'd be like, hey, everybody, I'm back. He'd be all cheery and shit. Lewis lost his shit. I got to admit, though, when Lewis's dad came up and they had that like 10 second conversation and they were both like almost cry. I started to cry. Like as a new dad, I was like, oh, oh, oh. so I got my money's worth. My whole year subscription to F1 paid in this thing. And it wasn't because Lewis won. It was because we got everything we wanted. Everything's working, right? Sure. George had a phantom issue, but probably not a tin hat thing. Probably not. Maybe not. I don't know. We'll see. I kind of, I kind of had like, you know, that, that moment too, you know, just, just seeing a father celebrate with his son, um, was cool. And I, and it's not cringe at all to see him cry. Uh, I, I, I think if you're, going, if you're going, if you're going to cry that was gold. For, for something, if you're going to cry for something, cry for something like this, uh, mm -hmm. oh, you absolutely. know, it's not I'm been not easy on him. It has not been easy on him the last two and a half years. You know, oh, boo like, who I is, won 100 is, plus races and I didn't win one for two <laughs> years. Oh, boo fucking who. You know, it's not easy when you walk into the cool down room and nobody wants to talk to you because you're almost no, no, double no, no, their no, age no. and you don't know did the language. You, did you hear what Max said to him? Well, what do you think? It's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. But Lewis calls him a ball uh, uh, hogger and fucking sits down. Like, I've got nothing against Lewis <laughs> yeah. at all. I was turned away sure. from the sport. Yeah, you say the that. Fucking me too. No, me too. Just like I walked away from Schumacher's era. I was like, this is boring shit. And Vettel too. I was like, but I, you know what? I was wrong about Vettel. And I think we all should have been watching. Go back and watch everybody. Go back and watch 2008 through 2014 every season. They're bangers. They were mm -hmm. not easily won series, right? And you'll see mm -hmm. everything. See everything in that, that time period. Lando said something fun in the cool down. He goes, even if I'd gotten out in front of you by three seconds, you still would have won. Talking to talking to Lewis, mm -hmm. because 
Lando knew he was going to burn through those tires, but he had to do it. He had to take that risk. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah, like, we got cars that work better on certain tires. And this is this is what makes it interesting. I'm fired up, throwing Cheerios and shit. It's fun. Max, I'm I'm a, who I'm who hard, else said, Jay, Jay, I think it was you, but it, it might have been you, Greg. Earlier in the year, you said the Mercedes loves the cold. Like that Merc car likes the cold and performs well in the cold. Yeah, okay, so. <laughs> tires. <laughs> It like needs yep. the cold and it needs high downforce tracks to work. It's a draggy car, if I remember correctly, from the beginning of the season. And that's not something mm -hmm. that they're really going to like totally work out of the chassis. They're going to work with it and they're going to try and diminish the negative effects of that. So all teams do this stuff. Red Bull just happens to get their shit really right most of the time. Today, yeah. I, Max came, you know, a second and a half from winning from sixth and a crap start. Like the guy's good. You know, we talk about Lewis being great in the rain. Lando's good in the rain. Piastri's good in the rain. Max is good in the rain. Like, and Signs didn't make any mistakes. He just didn't have a great card underneath him today. Oh, well, yeah. Yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I was also right. Uh, Max almost parroted me word for word with what I said about his reaction uh, to the incident with Lando. And, you know, again, hats off to him for saying, no, we're going to wait and let it cool down. And then, you know, afterwards, he released a statement to the media and said, you know, we're, we're good friends. We, we sim race together off the grid. You know, this was just hard, hard racing. There's no hard feelings between the two of us. And then that's the way I knew it was going to end up. Those guys are, are bigger than that moment. And they're both professional racers, right? Lando was a little more pissy pants with his comments, a little more bitter. Obviously he didn't finish the race. Um, he doesn't have three championships so, to like, Rest his shoulders on. <laughs> yeah, a exactly that too. And and so one of the things that Max also said is that you know Lando's going for a second win. I'm going for my 60 second win. Um, you know, like there there's a stark difference. And he said, and I and I know what that feels like going back to my days where I'm trying to win. So I I it's good because he's displaying obvious empathy to somebody, and that relationship I think between the two of them is is only going to continue to flourish. It would be interesting to see them as teammates someday. Um, no. Although I don't think that will ever happen, it would take hmm. it would take a significant amount of humility from Lando to be Max's teammate because he would have to resign as a number two, and that's just not in the cards for him. I think not now. What if but if looking, Oscar gets if bought, looking ten years and Max has to come on to McLaren. Years, what? Oh wow, that would be. That would be as amazing. much I, shit as Zach Brown has talked about Max, Max will have no parts of him whatsoever. Guaranteed. Money talks, oh, sure. man. No, Money no, no, talks. no, 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 because Toto is literally throwing the checkbook at him repeatedly, like, please come, please come. No, it the has club. nothing to do with it, has nothing to do with money for Max on this one. That dude, no, I will say. If Red Bull does not get back to form, that Max will be gone in 26. And I think that's why Toto's waiting to announce an Antonelli. Mm. It could be why they're being pretty patient and hesitant. That's that's not uh bad speculation at all. Yeah, that's that's fairly accurate, I would think. Um what else? Do we have anything else for we were right, we were wrong? I don't think we said anything wrong. Um, the most controversial thing I've said, we've already said I was right on, which is now the rumors are in full force about DR3. So. Yep. And that see. is so such a wild turn of events from rumor to he's going to get dropped at the summer break to rumor now he's going to move up to the number one team during the summer break. Uh, it, it does give way to the fickle nature sometimes of this sport. Also, the rumor mongering, rumor mill. We tend to not dive too deep into that. We make our well declared hot takes that, like, yeah, this is probably whatever. But uh, no, I, I didn't see that coming. It, I, I am with you, Jay. You were right all the way. Like, they may want to put him in that car for a half a season because he can't do any worse than Checo is. And it, it honestly makes sense from the marketing standpoint because there's still a lot of DR3 fans out there. Absolutely, and I think you make up a lot of the money back from the Telem whatever Telemexico sponsor and the merchandising sponsor because you'll get DR3 who has his own brand who will bring in a ton 
because they'll be like, wait, the three is back on the Red Bull shirts. Let's go. So you're going to see an automatic pickup plus controversy creates cash. You're going to see DR3 merchandise fly off the shelf. You're going to see Liam Lawson uh, merchandise fly off the shelf. Like you would see changes in my wardrobe. Middle school girls everywhere will be wearing Liam Lawson's shirt. No, Yuki, come on now. You know better. <laughs> but um, Yuki's still actually, too short for middle school girls. Uh, so I'm going to address the chat for a second here. Fabian, Bono cannot go to Ferrari with Lewis for at least one year. He has to stay off. Mm. And that's uh, point, due to gardening point. leave and everything like that. It, they actually spoke about this. Oh, when was this? Back in March, I think they were mentioning this. That uh, no Mercedes people that are attached to Lewis can go with Lewis because of uh, non-disclosure and non-compete uh, compete agreements. So just like Nui would have had to take gardening leave if they wouldn't have taken him off the projects, then uh, he would have to wait that period of time. Um, also, the Nui thing. I, I'm going to put this out there now. How fucking hilarious would it be if Nui's new team is just V-Carb. I'm just saying. Because everybody's all up in arms. Oh, he's going to AM. Oh, he's going to Ferrari. Oh, he's going here. No, he's staying in the Red Bull family and going to V-Carb to fix that shit show. And then it becomes better than Red Bull. Doubtful on that. But they use, you got to remember, they both share the same factory now too. That's how Red Bull's getting around the catering budget. Let's go. The catering budget strikes again. Gosh, that was so right. crazy. Like they, that financial regulation was was wild. Um, yeah, bad the penalty for them. It was bad only like three hundred thousand. It was literally like three hundred thousand over one hundred fifty thousand over. It wasn't enough for development. It literally was the catering budget. It, yeah, it literally was. And it, and it was a brand new reg. I think there could have been some leeway there. But also at the same time, I'm not going to pretend like the FIA didn't gift them a championship ahead of Lewis <clears throat> just to create drama, just to create all the, the nonsense that the FIA likes to create for drawing yeah. the sport. You said it too. Controversy sells. Controversy you know, I'm sells. I'm not disagreeing. All I'm yep. saying is, is I think everybody was sick of Lewis Hamilton dominance. They needed something Max- because ratings were suffering. Max deserves a championship, but deserves shouldn't be used in a like a puppet master kind of way where they're like, oh, oh absolutely. we're going to give it to Max this time, right? We're all in agreement there. Like, we want to see a good battle, but we don't want to see one decided by stewards. These all these like we're investigating. Noted. Now we're going to give them third twenty seconds off. Like, ah! the okay. track limit still so, kills me. Ah! Here's the thing: like Lando deserved the track limits violations last weekend. He was literally going. Here's the track. Here's Lando. Like, there was no trying at that point. He was literally just trying to get the dive ball. No, he was part. avoiding Max, and he knew Max was going to be everywhere, so he had to be somewhere other than the racetrack in order to not get hit by Max. It's simple math. Okay. okay. <laughs> I say next week, we dive into the 2021 season. Ooh. Because no, there no, no, is no. so it, many parts of uh, that race or that season that should have changed. Botas bowling. <laughs> okay. Cops. Like hey, hey, do me a favor, really quick. Check chat. We're checking the chat. And keep going. We're going to the secret chat. I, I like I like what you're saying. Internal chat, private chat. Oh. Uh, yes. I like what you're saying. I think 2021 is a good one. Yeah, we're on an off race weekend. So yeah, might as well. Um, we are going to continue ahead as soon as our producer gets back. Um, we're going to stick around actually for another 30 minutes and, uh, keep the show going. And if we can get the number banner to, I'll, I'll talk to Jewel about this, but. And if anybody out there doesn't understand what we're doing, we are freewheeling this. Like we are just passionate F1 people. Yes. Rich, Rich tries to keep us under control and it doesn't work. No, like he's all. like the adult, but you know. Rich, rich and adulting, huh? <laughs> but, yeah, talk to both my ex-wives <laughs> about that. <laughs> I think I met both of them, haven't I? You I have. I, you, the first you, one. I don't know if I met the second one. One of the few people who know 
both of my ex-wives. You did um, you had a couple parties. Oh, you that's right. Julius is going away. Parties. That's right. Yep. Gents, focus. Um, I don't need to be the adult here. We're talking about F1. Come on. Okay. You don't need to so, know about all these old strippers. Right. Get out of here. All right. So, hey, so we do Rory, Rory losers, gambled big winners, time this or? weekend. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Switch. Biggest losers, biggest winners. Oh, we could do biggest losers right now and talk, still talk about Ferrari. Why? That's what I was going to. On the yes. first rain issue, delay, whatever, they were like, ah, Leclerc, our quote-unquote number one driver, let's make him decide that we're going to do a strategy. No. Like, I get it that some things go wrong, but, like, they went way wrong. Like, Leclerc was instantly a lap down. I'm like, holy shnike. And if you watch um, – our viewers will love Rocket Power Mohawk. Yeah, Rocket Power Mohawk. His Rocket thing Boy. this week. Oh my God. Like he breaks it down so succinctly. And he's one of those people like John Stewart, like he uses humor, but he's spitting facts. And like Ferrari just finds new ways to do it wrong. And for the longest time, Signs and Leclerc have been like, no, I'm not doing that. Right. Like tell me what the chat strategy choices are and I'll go with them. Mixed conditions. These guys shouldn't be that bad. Leclerc was instantly way the hell down. And Signs like was like, <laughs> Do whatever you didn't do to him. And, like, he ended up, what was he, fifth or sixth? Like, a reasonable effort for a car that wasn't going to go to the front that weekend. Kept it on the track. Kept from being passed by everybody. Duh. What do you think, Jay? He got passed by a lot. But he didn't. Like, he wasn't in the back. Like, Signs was okay. Signs okay. got points. <laughs> so, I will agree. Ferrari, definitely the absolute biggest loser of the weekend, minus Checo. Checo by far <laughs> takes that candle. Like, I'm sorry. Oh, literally, they are – you are literally going through qualifying. They're saying, Checo is racing for his seat right now, blah, blah, blah. And you fuck it <laughs> off into the distance. Like, and then you're so stupid that instead of, hey, you know what? I'm beached. I know the regulations say I cannot get any type of mechanical help and re-enter the fucking qualifying. And he's sitting there asking the stewards to give him a push. Like, yeah. or not stewards, Marshall. Sorry, I apologize. Yeah. I'm like, the yeah. fuck are you Might doing? Like, same people. I'm pretty sure that's what Horner was like, and we hired this motherfucker for. Yep. Like, Max went off in that same corner, but he was yeah. smart enough to go off straight and continue driving through the ground. Magnuson like, did the same thing. Yeah. Well, Magnuson, I thought that was a given. He was just always off somewhere, like, driving aggressively. Yeah. But throw K Mag into, into one of the the biggest losers category this week. Yeah. Most, mostly because his teammate is coming to the biggest winners, but I'll sit, I'll table that. Mm -hmm. I'll table that. Um, yep. let's go ahead and, and finish off the biggest losers. McLaren probably biggest losers because they, they had it a strong chance to have two guys on one the podium. Two. They could have gone one, two, but he, uh, I'll even account for even the bad pit stop strategies or something sure. going wrong in the, in the way. And they could, they still could have had two, three. You know, Lewis, Lewis still passed and got in front of everybody, right? And he was there. So, mm -hmm. save for a, a bad Max Verstappen strategy on pit stop, or excuse me, a bad pit stop that he had, you know, then he would have been up there in the top three, as far as I'm concerned. But if McLaren yeah. had done everything right, everything perfectly, the way that they absolutely have to do to finish ahead of Max, yep. uh, they they could have gotten it. And so that's. It's just one more week of mistakes, and and it's shared blame throughout the team. And Greg, I'm glad you pointed that out. It wasn't just on you know driver or or the team on the on the back end. It was a shared error, error and unfortunate for them. But they're gonna keep getting better. And this just we're the winners, all of us. Of yeah, we are. McLaren push pushing up on Red Bull, like. It's exciting now. We're not getting what you guys get frustrated by where we, you know, we had the Schumacher years and dominance and, and, you know, we're seeing the Verstappen dominance taper off and we don't have the Lewis dominance. So, you know, now we have actual legitimate competition at the front of the grid. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're going to go ahead and take one quick break and we're going to stick around actually for another 30 minutes. So you're on a very special episode of the Pit Stop Podcast. We're going to do an hour and a half today. And then we will we think. get back with our biggest winners? Yeah. Oh, I still got one more biggest loser. George Russell's Who? water bottle. <laughs> That's literally I thought it was why he went out is his water. Let's go. 
expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent. Find us on the web at mbradio.us. Hello, and you are listening to the Pit Stop Podcast. We are proudly affiliated with Military Broadcast Radio, and that is mbr.us. Look us up on the web and wherever you like to get your podcasts. Um, so biggest winners. This weekend, Lewis Hamilton, and, you know, unfortunately, Mercedes. But we were talking right before we got off, actually, about this water system issue. I assumed it was some kind of water cooling system and, like, a mechanical issue with the car. You're telling me that this is over drinking water? But why? How in... Somebody make it make sense, because no way. (laughs) Like, I, I, I can't to make fathom it make sense. That. And this is why I was saying, like, it kind of felt a little sketch. Um, that but by certainly FIA leads some regu- there. But by FIA regulations, they have to have active water systems like that during the actual race. Because dehydration, wrecking the car, everything else. Wait a minute. Okay, so in Singapore, when everybody was super dehydrated... And passing out, they had functional water systems that just ran dry. But yet, at a cold event where it's actively raining, he had to stop because what? It ran out of water. I don't know if it got so, like jammed. I'm gonna double check this, but that's the only water system in those cars. Everything I else think is I done can with hydraulic fluid. Sense from here. I think I can make it make sense from here. I think I broke. So right. after. <laughs> After each and every race, right, there there is a minimum weight for the car and a, a and the driver. If that driver gets dehydrated and is not able to rehydrate himself to a sustainable weight, that could very potentially drop that minimum car weight. That's why you see them get out the top three. They get out and they immediately go over and stand on a scale because you have to weigh the driver and you have to weigh the car. And it has so, to be, yes. I think, 830 kilograms or something like that. So there, there is this minimum weight that you must maintain, and that would throw that off. But that is yeah, the but, only logical reason right. I could have to explain why you'd want to do it. I know it's chintzy. I know it's bullshit, right? But tell me, like, it, that wouldn't happen. If, if he came in and he was two kilograms underweight or a kilogram underweight, and it's like, well, my water system broke. It could happen. It could happen. And like I, that's the only logical explanation I can fathom for why that would be in the rules, and why it would, must be mandatory for your water system to be maintained at all time. Either that, uh, or uh, if it's literally squirting in your face, where you normally have a fucking you're wearing a helmet, you're, you're wearing a helmet George, in the rain. George is the one that was you're like, it's rich, rich, you know, rich, 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 rich. You've ran the motor. <laughs> Still, you're right. You're right. Safety, in safety, safety, safety. It makes sense of things that don't make sense. Yeah. Right. No, but I'm saying there's a huge difference between water coming up in your face like this 
versus on a helmet and only a little bit of it seeping in. Fair enough. I ride motorcycles. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, Sometimes I know. A helmet, so, yeah. George was the one that was I, I, like, it's raining that. in turn five. And it wasn't. It was actually his sweat. So, it was yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot you know, about so, that. That was what? Last year? So strange. Time? Yeah. It was weird. He was like, it's raining. And everyone's like, where? The hell is he talking about? I read there was a lot of those calls like, the rain is going to end in 10 minutes. And they're like, I got news for you. It's dry on track. I'm like, okay. Yeah. So that'll be another good off season topic is just the, the physical toll that F1 takes on these guys and what they have to do to physically prepare themselves. Um, like they may not look like it, but they train like professional athletes. Um, every single one of these guys has to work very, very hard. Definitely. So, biggest winners. Uh, my biggest winner this weekend. K Matt or not K Bag uh Nico Holkenberg. <laughs> Holkenberg, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Sixth place. What is that? Two weeks in a row now? Rich disappeared yeah. from us. Like, points, points, points. And for a guy that's getting a big ride, like he's going to Audi. Well, Sauber, he's going to Audi, and like they're they're seeing value. They must. They must be like, look at this guy. He's taking a Haas, which is like Ferrari spare parts, and <laughs> he's putting it in the points every week, right? When K Mag is yeah, he's there. But, you know, K-Mag. And then it was just me. Oh, I'm back. No, now I'm gone. <laughs> Damn it, French. Yeah. French bro. Okay. So, um, I also had I also had Holkerberg on my, my biggest winners list. Um, I, you know, I, I got to say, Max, a hell of a drive from Max. Like, for a call <laughs> early on, he just kept driving. Hell of a drive from Piastri, who got screwed. He just kept pushing. Um, Poor Jordan, What? Yeah. Can somebody explain to me what actually happened to Gasly? Because I turned my head in all of a sudden and said, out. Trans. It's transmission. Oh, they, they said that something wrong with the transaxle, which, gotcha. you know, they changed a ton of stuff on that car. So it's like, so it's not, not surprising. Here's a, here's a fun I'm, fact that Rich will be interested in. Did you know that Nico Hulkenberg holds the records for most career starts without a podium? Yeah. At 215. Man. And he's. Give he was my man a sport. fucking podium. <laughs> he was out of the sport, right? He was like on vacation, and I think it was Aston Martin. We we're like, hey, uh, or maybe it was Racing Point at that point. They were like, hey, uh, can you come in and sub for us? And he was like, sure. And he finished like 18th or something, right? It was like inconsequential. And then all of a sudden, Haas was like, I got a great idea. You know those two guys that almost fought each other? <laughs> Let's make them teammates and see what happens. And to their credit, nothing's happened. They haven't crashed into each other. They're just fine. Now they're like, whatever. So oh, the line good on him for coming back from the dead. Yep. The All this line talent living lurking. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> if you go back and look at like prime Nico Hulkenberg, there's a great mini documentary on him. I think it's like an hour. The dude was something else. Like he had some phenomenal races in his earlier career when he was with teams and in series that allowed him to flourish. And we got to remember, we're watching 20 or maybe 24, if you count all the people that come in and out during the course of a season, of the best drivers in the world that were in the right place at the right time, right? So yep. obviously some of them not so best, but right place, right time, or right dad, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it's just, you know, we're we're watching the best of the best. Somebody's got to lose, and we're here like, oh, this guy sucks. We're like, no, he's not really that bad. <laughs> he's just in the wrong team or whatever. So, My other biggest yeah. winner, Who? Liam Lawson. Because you think he's getting a seat. He's getting a seat. They will yeah, fucking yeah. cut someone to put him in that mm -hmm. Red Bull because they are not going to let him go to Salva. There is no way they let him go there. They have put six years into him, I believe. So. <laughs> or he just jumps ship and goes somewhere else. But they, they uh, have he could pull cars. a Piastri. He could pull a Piastri, absolutely. Honestly, but at that point, if he, at that point, if yeah. I was them. I would go grab K Mag. He's already been, it's Ooh. already been said he is not going to be a hash driver next year. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. He's out. He's out. Hey, yeah, because it's Lawson? Gonna be what? Ocon and fucking yeah. uh, uh, Bearman. Like, come on. Yeah. Don't do this to that poor kid. I... <laughs> Whatever. So K Mag would be a wild card. He's a bulldog. He's always going to fight. He's like an Ocon. Um, but Lawson, I see him being like a Piastri. Chill kid, solid, solid results, like no drama. Just put him in the car. Put him in some car. 
somewhere. Just you take know? his manager and take him out back and beat him. Well, I see Red Bull as being a trap. Red Bull is like a jail. You're either in Gen Pop or you're in solitary confinement next to Max. Like, there's no – you're either with the serial killer or you're one of the killers, right? Like, you don't get to choose, really. And that's a, that's one of the things I don't like about these feeder – not series. The feeder series are okay. But, like, the, the feeder um, racing, whatever you want to call them. Somebody help me out here. The, everybody's fucking – Feeder like, series. Academies. They're literally called the feeder series. Yeah, yeah no, it's it, not the it's, series, though. It's yeah. not the F2s and the F3s. It's the people that finance them. They're like, we're going to help this person come in. Granted, everybody's been down this road. You're talking Lewis about the Driver Academies? The Driver Academies. Thank you. They, they also, Thank Driver you. Academies, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is one of the things. Like, everybody needs the help to get to the top, and this is how it happens. And you don't have the help. You got people winning F2 by large margins, and then they're not racing anymore. That doesn't make any sense. So I don't like it. I don't like the driver academies. Well, like this goes back to what we said before. There's too many old heads sticking around for no fucking reason at this point. Lewis, you're not getting your eighth world title. I hate to tell you this. You picked wrong. You you picked can't say that wrong. with 2026 Old regulations. I you cannot say that with 2026 regulations coming out. If you think oh, no, he said it, who not Ferrari is going to fire and hire between now and then, if it's you think going this in his people's the turbo hybrid. All over again, Toto Dark Lord Wolf has <laughs> what? shit unlock. Mercedes will be the top engine, nah. guaranteed. Maybe, maybe, maybe. maybe I feel like not. everybody got we'll quiet. See. We're like, I think we will see. If if one thing Ferrari does do well is they build engines very well. Do you when not remember not last season? In, intentionally burning not last the year. That's barbecue. one season. And the year That's before that, season. and the year before that, <laughs> the, the All right. turbo not right now. But we're talking about the Ferrari. longest tenure team in the sport of the history. They do build good engines. Other teams use their engines. They Knock can. it off. They, they can build good engines. Mercedes builds yeah. phenomenal engines. Yes, Renault. Mercedes you're right, and I'm not arguing that. It's Honda, but yeah. Not okay. always. All right, that's like saying Reno- that's saying like Renault is a great team because they used to build great engines. Or Williams used to be an amazing Fine. team, and then Frank got to mention and that went straight the fuck out the window. I mean, for fuck's sake, the technology, the right engineering, now. the development like what Ferrari does, the standard that Ferrari sets, they like they're going to come back and build good engines. I promise you, like it, it doesn't yeah. stop. They're one of the they best in, in the world for this reason specifically. Yeah. And their waves, let's be honest, their waves are usually HL near the top. top. Are you are you on that hopium right now that you know? <laughs> Lewis isn't hey, making a bad decision. Leclerc, Leclerc comes along with That's that. That's not what it is. Right? Don't forget. That's not what it Leclerc is. Leclerc is I, also in Ferrari. I believe in Ferrari. And don't forget, what, what they, they just took second in the Constructors' Championship, so you can talk about your shit, but they were still second to Red Bull with the best car in the world. Knock it off. By less points than Max brought in. Max could have literally raced without so Checo. Okay. Still fucking yeah, okay. all right. Max fair. is living his Lewis lifestyle. Max is living Max? his Lewis Schumacher lifestyle. Knock it off. Like, come on, man. <laughs> he was fair. enjoying of the best fucking car on a cheating ass team. They got penalized and fined. That was favored by the FIA. And the only goddamn reason he won that championship in 2020, and you know it, was the bullshit so controversial decision the FIA made so in the steward. Okay, 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 hold up. I foremost, had something to say. Corner is all I really have to say. Max was Murder ahead scene. by 48 points at that point in the fucking series. 48 fucking points. Lewis knew that shit and goes, oh, fuck this little motherfucker. Yeet. That's not what Straight happened. to a wall. Botas. Next fucking race. Botas goes bowling for Red Bulls. <laughs> got one of them. Listen. No, he got both of them, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was the other one I was thinking of. Fucking. Or wait, did he get three of the four cars? I think he might have got three of the four. Anyway. Regardless. Listen, I'm not going to argue that, that Botas probably took somebody out that he should have. And he okay, it, that may now, have been motivated. However, it doesn't change what I'm saying. Party mode. Let's talk about fucking party mode on the engines. No, because I got something to say about Ferrari. Okay, I'm sorry. Not even Ferrari. Right, I got Greg it on Honda. We were on Ferrari. <laughs> Got a leg up. They were building garbage engines, right? That literally drove Alonzo to leave the sport. I almost said hobby because <laughs> he's got better things to do. It's just a hobby for him. They were allowed to make performance upgrades. This is Honda. So they made performance upgrades, and now they are making reliable engines that typically do not go up in flames like some of the Ferrari ones, right? 
but they got a leg up and all the other teams said, okay, we're now going to make uh, upgrades to our engine because they're wounded, right? But it, they was, were performing. So that's how Renault got behind. Honda is only where they are because we let them be performant. They did not come up on their own to be performant. We had to give gift this to them. Red Bull got that benefit throughout Max's tenure. So don't get it twisted. It was a freak thing that Red Bull went from having the worst engine, slowest Renault's, to the best engine. And Renault got even fucking slower because they didn't take advantage of the upgrades. So, like, Max and Nui and everybody else there, Horner, they made the most of that. And they have a super dominant package, driver included. So, going forward, 2026, all bets are off. Like, we will see what goes down. I still expect Ferrari to be like, we're in fourth. We challenge for the win. We're in fourth. We challenge for the win season after season. Like, this is what they do. They're clowns. Over. Excellent Anyways. points. All right. Now let's get back into our Red Bull Mercedes drama. Hey, also, let's, let's not delve too deep into this because we're okay, going to have our fair. guest let's, on, and I want to outnumber let, you. Also, we, we are going to talk about the entire 2021 20, season next week. So I yep, don't want to step on next on. week's episode in, in tonight's, but I – I am looking very much forward to this debate. I will go back and watch the 2021 season as much as I can in the next week. And, and yeah, we'll, we'll come equipped, but we got to be prepared. Um, hey, gents, before you jump off, Greg, we're going to actually prematurely bring on our guests because we're we're going extra long this week. We're going to do a marathon episode, but, yeah, we're going to have Fabian come on. And, uh, yeah, welcome to the stage, Fabian. Let's see if I can get this layout right, but, yeah. Do your producer stuff, Rich. God, Rich. Make it happen. I need to get RPM on here for uh, the offset this. <laughs> the Lewis Hamilton fanboy club over here. <laughs> I want to see dominance. <laughs> the ominous laugh in the background. I can hear it. Ooh, uh, uh. I can taste the tin. In the hat, I can. I swear. <laughs> I wish we got him. Can you hear him? Yep, I got him. I'm I'm uh, rearranging the layout now to get the camera on. Gotcha. Good stuff, Fabian. All right, there we so go. So it's so it's it's Fabian because I don't pedal butter. Okay, <laughs> and I don't have long hair. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Noted. I mean, I use butter, but that's a different conversation. Yeah, that cocoa butter. But uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> so, baby, welcome to the show, man. Yeah, we're. I, hey I got to fight and defend my my favorite driver, Lewis Hamilton, week in week out. Maybe just because we're staff and fanboy. Greg is, know, yeah, Greg so, is so like like as long as I defend my point, Greg is good with it. So, so what? So, what is that pecking order? So, is is, uh, is Greg the Verstappen guy? No, no. Greg Jay, Jay is all Verstappen. Is Greg's pretty agnostic. I, uh, gotcha, okay. I'm a Lewis fanboy. I, and I have clarified this. The one, one of the many reasons why I like Lewis Hamilton is for the person he is off the grid as much as the driver that he right. is on the grid. Right. I never, ever negate or fail to mention that yes, he was granted the benefit of a great car much similar mm -hmm. to what other people would consider one of the greatest drivers of all time in Michael Schumacher. He Absolutely. also had a great car. Sure you did. don't get to win week in, week out the way he does without being as disciplined as he was, without being as focused and, and committed as he has been his entire life. He did not get yeah. there on accident. And yes, he was the recipient and benefit of a car with party mode that was just well beyond anything that was on the grid. You Knocked know, the shit out of Red Bull week in, week out when they were dealing with Renault engine and engine issues. And as soon as they got a true. Honda engine and a real car, Verstappen comes in too. But the car driver debate is very weird. different upbringings too, even in their youth and their karting history. Right. Like Lewis Hamilton's dad was not a professional race car driver. Mm -mm. You know, he, all right, Rich, he let the did man all talk. This on his own merit. I am. No, I'm finished running. No, no, he's finished. No, you all the time. That's good setup. No, I, I was saying that the, the car driver debate is such a weird one because truthfully, when it all comes down to it, there's a symbiotic relationship that has to exist between a driver and a car, right? And 
a driver, you know, a, and I don't want to, we won't do the check over staffing thing, but a, a driver in a team, A and B, you know, when a car is being developed, sometimes you got you to gotta realize those cars are being developed to really favor a particular driver because they're going to maximize points the best way they can, right? And so there's a symbiosis that happens with one driver with that car that the other driver may not ever achieve. It's just not ever going to happen. But you do hope at least they're not putting it in wall and, you know, they're not doing things to the car like running it over bad spots and messing up the floor and all those kind of stuff that's going to degrade the amount of points they can get. But ultimately, you know, it's funny because the the die die hard Verstappen and die die hard Hamilton fans to use the two top guys really in the world, right? They, they always flip flop on this argument because when the car is performing badly, it's the car's fault. When the driver is performing badly, it's the driver's fault. Um, but ultimately, really, is it is it the chicken or the egg, or you know what's going on there? All I gotta say though <laughs> is Max has not been beaten in the same machinery by a teammate especially rossberg mm -hmm. rossberg, what do you mean, was rossberg? Not that, rossberg was not a good driver don't even give me that shit Do, listen he, he is was the best not, let me tell you something, in monaco but you, you could say he wasn't a good driver but the year that he won the championship he drove the wheels off that car to the extent that he immediately retired because he knew that if he continued like that, he was probably going to wind up killing himself. And he's the only guy that's ever beat Michael Schumacher every single year he drove against him. So. Sounds, sounds but, like but, he but, wasn't a good driver. But I'm curious, Jay, What? so the point that, that Max has not been beaten by a teammate in the same machinery means what? Oh, no, it's just a joke. The I, No, I'm... I, but, well, uh, I, I, so, yeah. so here's the thing. We always say you are compared to your teammate. Right. That That's is your fair. biggest competition is your teammate. Botas yeah. was never given that chance to go against Lewis. Right. Mm -hmm. And as Rich so throws up every time he gets a chance, well, he let Botas get past him whenever he couldn't catch up to somebody. How many times? I talk about that for talking about following team orders. On the radio, the three, and this is we'll get him started with all do that, and someone I'll threw a temper that. tantrum. <laughs> but no, I have. I disagree with you on this point, though. I don't agree with you that your biggest competition is your teammate. Yeah, maybe many drivers see it that way, but they're not driving the exact same machinery. They are not placed in like favored in the similar way. Like each time, now oh, there's team strategy, and and they change tires. For different reasons so it's in qualifying yes maybe your teammate is your your biggest rival but you're yeah. not going to tell me that checo perez is max verstappen's biggest rival rival and like you're not going to tell me that oscar is currently lando's biggest rival no, I am. I I'm gonna would say that. actually say Oscar <laughs> and Lando. All right. Yeah, that McLaren comparison was bad because I already said why earlier. They're no, damn near equivalent. It's not bad. In skill, That's in my appropriate. Opinion. Ferrari current. Russell, Russell in, in Lewis, right? Saw the change in the transition. Now that Lewis is, is leaving Three, and they know it. Four. Now that, that's <laughs> that's not his biggest rival, though. Five, six. So when you're when you're talking about moving teams, valuations from one team to the next. Like your teammate is your the benchmark because you're you are provided extremely similar cars. It is totally true that not everybody can be on the same tire strategy. Double stacks are super rare, and usually you want to cover off different people, so you'd have to be on different tires. And as much as everybody doesn't want to admit it, there are first tire first drivers and second drivers. So like you just got to do it. It it makes sense, That's right? What I mean. So yeah. Like so, that's true. Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan twists his ankle. Scotty Pippen's got to step up, right? That's it works like that. But, it's interesting but, when that's ahead. right, Greg. No, you're right. And 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 when Michael Jordan twists his ankle and Scotty twists his ankle, they don't wrap it the same way because it's different ankles. So when you're tuning the same car to a driver, mm -hmm. again, my point is when when I go out and do my free practice laps and they're looking at the data and they see what's slacking in the way the car's performing in my hands. Mm -hmm. When it comes into the garage, the team is putting an extra twist and an extra tuck and nip in different places for me than they do for the other guy. Just the way it works. Yeah. yeah. It is in all motorsports, not just Formula One, but when there's right. like hundreds of million dollars on the line, Precisely. they're going to do everything they can. So it's you weird when a George yeah. Russell comes in and is 
sometimes qualifying better than Lewis. But so Lewis, yeah. I think Lewis made the right choice for a number of reasons. And it's for the same reason nobody wants to go up against Max. So to say Max beat everybody, yeah, he did. He beat Danny Ricardo in his prime. Mm-hmm. But is Ricky the biggest, best package? Probably not. Awesome to be on the grid. Love yeah. him outside the grid. Yeah. But like when you, when you talk about other people that have won championships against other world champions, like, man, I would have rather seen Sainz and Leclerc be on a super dominant Ferrari team than to be on this, this you know, trailing back Ferrari team because that doesn't show us anything. Yeah. Show us a team that's coming forward, like McLaren with Piastri and, and Norris. Those two, like you're getting to see some awesome racing, and those two have luckily not taken each other out. Like I think bringing George in, I think bringing George in is part of what really screwed things up for Lewis for a while too. Because if they'd simply stuck with Botas, it wouldn't mm-hmm. have upset the apple cart nearly as much. Sure. It wouldn't have yeah. taken his mental acuity and focus in the direction that it had to go. Because all of a sudden, instead of having a guy that was the team player that was going to mm-hmm. play the role, he had a guy yep. that was really competing for his spot. And so yep. now he's not just driving for wins. You know, he's driving for, you know, notoriety and recognition yep. and all those other things you pile on with that. In, in McLaren, not McLaren, in Mercedes defense, I think if Lewis had won that eighth championship, he mm-hmm. probably would have walked, right? He, he, or he would have been like, man, maybe I'm going to walk. Probably. So they were already thinking, hey, well, we need another talent in here because it's not Botas. As much as Botas was able to better Lewis on certain days, he right. did it with the best car in the field, right? Now you put Botas in a, a crap car, no offense to, to Sauber, but like <laughs> – it is what it is. Like, he's not going to come through. He's not going to be a, a Hulkenberg and a Haas, right? It's right. still going to be in the back of the field. to be lucky to score points. So I think Mercedes did the right thing for what they had. But as soon as they weren't the, the team to be had, Lewis was like, oh, hell no. I want my eighth championship. I, and you saw that passion come out. And, he, but, you know, and he, as well as he should. You know, I mean, he certainly – he's got all the, all the telemetry and all the stats and all the data and all the records – to put him well into the real conversation. Because this whole GOAT conversation that comes up around Max is really weird, right? Because there's a T in that, right? There's, you know, greatest of all time. And you got to put in that time and then wash out all the data and say, okay, who was really pound for pound the best, right? Yeah. And and, and he's on the trajectory for it, but he's not sure. there yet, you know? Yeah. But when you start looking at the Schumacher-Hamilton debate, it's clear who between the two is ultimately really the GOAT. Then, of course, you can get into the gray area where you start to talk about, well, if he was in that car and if he was in these cars, and you know, we, mm-hmm. can, we can do that all day, and it's fun to do. But when it comes down to it, I mean, just in, in the race you know, yesterday alone, Hamilton added a bunch of other you know, possibly unreachable statistics to his already insane record. It's crazy. I got to hear the uh, the cook version of the call on the on the race that I posted on on Fofa, and I was like, man, where was he yesterday? You know, he's gone for three mm-hmm. races, not calling it, but it was really cool to hear it because the things that he said about it, you know, these astronomical, historical, nearly unreachable things, and it's going to be fun to watch somebody like Max really push himself with his incredible gift and talent to try mm-hmm. to see if he can achieve all those things and more. And God, if he really does, like, what an incredible time to be watching the sport and being a fan of the yeah. sport. Because that's yeah. a hell of a yardstick to be yeah. measured by. And just like, so more NBA stuff here, just like mm-hmm. LeBron would go from team to team and win championships, yeah. I want to see Max do it with more than just the magic he had in one spot. Like, Lewis got his first championship with McLaren and had some great seasons when Vettel became powerful. He, and he had a dominated. string of great seasons there. Yeah, like he was almost there. There was a lot of drivers in that era that, that could have won, right? He took but them out of obscurity Max. right up right up to the championship. And Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So I want to see Max win on multiple fronts, right? Because mm-hmm. Lewis has him with two, two different teams, going for three different teams now. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I just, this is good stuff. You know what we should do? Over the summer break, we should do an episode where we do our top five all-time drivers and why. And really like give ourselves the time to articulate this and argue with each mm-hmm. other. Be like, hey, hey, no, that guy sucked. Tell me why that you think that guy was top five. Does that technically do become that. a three-peat if he does it at Ferrari? Is that technically a three-peat? I don't know. I, I don't know. They don't, if you did them back-to-back, that'd be unheard of. But we are saying that Lewis makes the jump at the right time. So that might be what you get out of Lewis going to Ferrari. He's like, yeah, yeah. Look, did he call it again? Did he say, yeah, they have the, the components that they need? And if he's taking Newey with him, that'd be neat. You know, like. Hey, Nui, let's all go over there at the same time. We'll meet you for lunch in Italy. Right. Nui's not going to Ferrari. He's pretty much already said it, and we've talked about this. Mm, uh, a Fabian lot of things actually, are said. 
actually interesting topic you bring up about the the goat argument. Right. We mm-hmm. actually did a, a little bit of a segment on this a couple of weeks back where I am very much against any goat conversations because mm-hmm. you look at Jackie Stewart, Nikki Lauda, Michael Schumacher, you know, Aaron and Senna. You cannot compare those people whatsoever because they all came up in different times. I am mm-hmm. much more a fan of generational goat because you have so many different things that come into play. Like if there was a 24 race season while Michael Schumacher was doing his thing, do you think the race record would be anywhere near touchable? Cause I don't like absolutely not. Uh, but yet Max is already over half of Lewis's win totals. Mm-hmm. And he's been doing his dance for what? Three years. That he's actually been winning, winning. Right. Right. So you've got to look at it that way. Like there's no way to compare because the regulations, what was legal in the seventies is no longer legal in the nineties or the two thousands. Yep. So there's really no true. way to compare Jay. that. So we need to create a herd. Really true. So you get Gentlemen, the I hate to get you off. Okay. I got to, I got to interrupt. I got to interrupt. Okay. We got to do uh FCC guidance. Like, yeah, we can't mess around with it. So we're going to take a quick commercial break uh, for station identification I will see you soon. Greg's jumping off, but we will uh, be back next week. Bye, Greg. Miss you. Deuces. (laughs) This entire military is one cohesive, dedicated force. And the threats to our nations, they don't sleep. They're watching our every move. Iran, Russia, China, North Korea, ISIS, Al-Qaeda. They may be watching this right now. Our military should not be mistaken for our cable news gab fest show. We don't care what you look like. We don't care who you voted for. Who you worship, what you worship, who you love. It doesn't matter if your dad left you millions when he died or if you knew who your father was. We have been honed into a machine of lethal moving parts that you would be wise to avoid if you know what's good for you. We will not be intimidated. We will not back down. We've seen war. We don't want war. But if you want war with the United States of America, there's one thing I can promise you, so help me God. Someone else will raise your sons and daughters. I want to make it clear that the views expressed by our hosts are not considered the official stance of MBR views. Remember, this is all about having fun and enjoying the ride. Find us on the web at mbradio.us. We are back. Thank you, guys. Once again, we are hosted on mbradio.us, and you can find us wherever you enjoy finding your podcasts. We've got our special guest, Fabian, on from FOFA, Filmer One Fans of America. Man, thank you so much for coming on, especially Impromptu. I know we had scheduled for last week. We decided to run this episode a little over because we we can. Uh, we can talk about F1 all day. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming on, and, and pleasure to have you, my friend. It's, it's my pleasure to be Greg's doppelganger. <laughs> you guys look exactly alike. Yeah, I'm telling you. Totally, isn't that crazy? Who to thunk? Wait, that's not Greg. Shit. Um, <laughs> should I go as Lewis Hamilton for Halloween or no? That would get you canceled. No. Um, <laughs> that anyways, would get us canceled. Definitely not. Oh wow, my whole background is bugged out. Sorry. Um. So, yeah, no, like I was saying, the generational thing is, Mm -hmm. I think, more a realistic stipulation put on things. Right. Because even trying to compare eras, like the turbo hybrid era versus the aerodynamics era, Mm -hmm. there's no competition, just like there was no competition in the uh, turbo hybrid. And, I mean, Vettel doing what he did in... 10 to 14 was huge, you know? So, I mean, yeah. 
trying to say that, oh, well, this person's the GOAT because this, that, and the other. And another thing that uh, Rich has said in the past is if you want to be the best, you got to beat the best. So doesn't that make Max the GOAT now at that point? In what way? He beat Hamilton 2021. So, yeah, okay. one year, man. Like, start, start stacking up championships <laughs> and, and I'll breaking I'll records, and then we'll talk, man. Yeah. yeah. He's too, too I'm pretty sure. And I included in that conversation. Of, you you can really leave out, year. but I said he has to go and beat these records. He has to start these championships. I don't question his yeah. ability to. I think the regulations are going to nope, inhibit, not in, at all. Excuse me, inhibit him. Um, uh-huh. If anything inhibits or slows him down. So, like, short of Red Bull shitting the bed – like he he does stand a very good chance to run up against all of Lewis's records. He has the all of the talent in the world. Yeah, he does. I take nothing away from him. One of the things that, that you pointed out earlier, Fabian, that I really enjoyed mm-hmm. was like the way they tailor a car to a specific driver. Um and Max, because of his experience with, with karting, because of the hammer that was placed over his head by his father to know the car inside and out to maintain the car yourself. You know, you see him working on the carts, you know, by himself, not without the assistance of his father. He knows how to build a car for his driving style. And he has a very specific driving style that Jay's highlighted in the past. And I take nothing away from Max as a driver ever. Um, Mm -hmm. It is very hard to compare the two of them because even Lewis has transposed generations, right? We're looking at almost two different, generations over the course of 20 years of racing that he's been in and and certainly technological advances in a a Mm -hmm. different era in one of these things too like i i agree with jay wholeheartedly that it's near impossible to compare people from differing generations that's like the ageless lebron and jordan debate right absolutely absolutely lebron didn't have bill and beer hammering him in the paint you know, the way That's Jordan right. did. There, there was right. fouls that existed and physical like attributes to the game. There was also a level of talent that exists now today that didn't necessarily exist back then. You had guys that sure. looked like they were, you know, assistant principals in my high school playing in the NBA and guarding Jordan in the 80s. Absolutely. And it's like, who, who the and hell now, are these guys? Like, they, come on. Yeah. These guys would now have never made it. These kids, right. Yeah. Yeah. No, with the internet, the internet changed – everything for everyone right just really not did. because of connectivity and communication but because of your ability to access information and to tailor data in different ways and data science right. has elevated things especially in the aspect of motorsport they cannot go overlooked and unacknowledged so i agree with jay that it, it's almost valueless to try to compare i do like the idea of ranking our our top five drivers um i'm going to take right. a, a quick break but when i come back i want to talk about our current top five drivers on the grid and see like between the, the three of us okay. who we have is our top five, one through five, but okay. I'll let you guys go ahead and talk about whatever you feel like right now. Okay, cool. <laughs> so Jay, uh, real quick, when did you, when did you dip your toes into formula one? Oh, so lightly in the early nineties. Yep. Yeah. Okay. A little bit gotcha. more. In the early 2000s mm-hmm. era was it was okay to watch it was boring as a fan other if you were a fan other than ferrari i will say right. that. yeah this is true came around with that new team where they'd only been around for four years and it was like okay let's see what right. you guys especially coming off the bronze season the year prior and right. i was like okay and like we said earlier you had Vettel that was actually competing for these championships. It wasn't just a give me championship. No. And I stepped away probably the season after the Rosberg uh, title. Okay. Because it was more of a, this is pointless to watch. It is the same constructor winning absolutely everything. And by miles, it wasn't even like close. Um, so I stepped away and then I had a buddy of mine in 2021, like, well, 2020 into 2021, talking it up, just constantly Mm -hmm. running his mouth. He's like, there's this new kid that's up and coming. There's a bunch of great drivers now. It's not just Mercedes show anymore. Right. And 
that was the year that Max had won the first championship of his. And then it was like, okay, this is actually interesting. The beginning of 22 had Ferrari poking their heads around. 23 had Checo poking his head around. Now this year, you actually have five different drivers across 12 or six different drivers across, uh, or no, it is five, sorry, across 12 races. So you're like, Mm -hmm. okay, this is actually getting interesting. It's going to be sad mm-hmm. to see it all go to hell in 26, though. The crazy thing about 26 is how it, it could really, it could go anywhere. You know, the thing about that regulation change year is how anybody could get it right. And so many people have the opportunity to get it wrong. And all of a sudden you could see someone emerge that you just wouldn't have expected, especially with the wholesale changes that they're offering this time around, because it's impacting so much of the way the sport works with the, with the X and Z mode and the DRS thing and and, you know, all that. Um, I actually, so I'm 60 years old. So I was watching Schumacher and Prost and all those guys. Um, I didn't know what I was looking at. I mean, you know, I was, I was watching this stuff when I was seven and eight years old and and I remember it vividly, but I didn't really understand it. I just liked fast cars, you know? Um, And then eventually I tacked into other things like football and basketball and all that. And and F1 kind of fell off the map. And it was my son who's 30 that got me into it. He actually woke up one day when he was about 10 years old. And my TV was on in the living room. And I was like, what is going on in my house? We're supposed to be sleeping. You know, it was like really early in the morning, like two, four, two, three o'clock in the morning. And he was sound asleep on the sofa and the TV was on and the 24 hours of Le Mans was on the television. And this is the first time I discovered that my 10 year old son even liked racing. Right. You know, so quickly we start talking about it. And he's like, yeah, I watch this and I, I like this Formula One stuff. And I'm like, OK, well, you know, 20 years later. Um, I'm sitting down, you know, watching Drive to Survive and looking at the F1 channel and just kind of reading through stuff. And all of a sudden I get sucked into it like it like Twister, like a vortex, literally. I mean, I got pulled in so hard. My wife was really upset with me. She's like, what is wrong? (laughs) Like, You know, you've got something F1 in your face all day long. Um, And it started to rekindle and make me think back to all these races that I watched when I was a young kid, you know, and just trying to see what was the trajectory between the time that I was watching and present day. And of course, you know, you accelerate into this season and it's crazy to see, like you just pointed out, how much parity is developing all of a sudden. And that is really cool. Like that's exciting stuff. And it's not, you know, like the way the NFL does it by just shuffling everybody around because of money and salary caps and things. It's really the, the engineering prowess and the driver development cohesion and all that stuff that has to come together. And these people are probably, I mean, when do they sleep? You know, they're crunching number and data and looking at, you know, telemetry and and the whole nine yards and they're finding the strangest, the most remarkable and most intricate and interesting little things to do. And it's like, well, if we just put a little wisp over here, that'll happen. And if we put a little thing over there, that'll happen. And you hear it every week and you see people talk about their upgrades and they don't really work out and they lose pace or whatever the case is. And then you see what we're seeing now where for the last few weeks, there's this incremental increase in what's going on with the McLarens and the Mercedes. And then there's this somewhat intermental decline of what's going on with the RB20 and all of a sudden it, their, their paths are, di- you know, diverging and it, converging. And it's really cool to see that, you know? So you've got the people drama with the drivers, you got the team drama with the principals, and then you have the real unsung heroes behind the scenes, which are the people who are doing all this work and manufacturing and the plants and so forth, coming up with these things and then handing these toys and these tools back to these guys and say, okay, guys, could y'all stop fighting and just drive the car, you know? I definitely don't disagree. Oh, sorry, Rich. No, go ahead. I was just going to say. I was just going to jump in with myself, but I'll let you finish first. Sorry. So I find it very interesting that people who stepped away from the sport and just love fast cars and got brought back in because of uh, DTS fall Mm -hmm. into one of three camps. Lewis Hamilton, Vettel until he retired, or, or no, not Vettel, sorry, Charles Leclerc, or DR3. 
Those are the three camps that you will fall into coming out of it. Because if you look at the older fans, like that didn't really get sucked back in by DR or by Drive to Survive, you see, like, I'm hardcore a Yuki supporter. Like, Rich may bust my balls about Verstappen, but <laughs> Yuki is my favorite driver on the grid, hands down. But that's an he's, oddity. You don't see like that. A, like a journeyman, you know? He's just this foul mouth little chucklehead, and it is great, and it is refreshing because he's not polished at all. Right. He is he's an like amazing yeah. driver. Like, he's good. it's incredible. So, he's good. sorry, Rich, didn't mean to interrupt you on that. No, you're good, brother. I, I think it was like a mutual thing, but I need you to let you get your thought out. Um, yeah, I'll chime in on my spiel, but uh, I, yeah, Yuki is kind of like us on our show is commentators on F1. We are not polished. We are not professional. We will say the F word. Uh, you know, we're, we're all military veterans and yeah, we, we tell the way we see it. Uh, I think that's maybe one thing that would set us apart from any other uh, F1 coverage is because yeah, we're, yeah, maybe maybe RPM, but like, you know, we we tell it the way we we like to tell it, and uh, fortunately, we have a great platform that uh, lets us speak our minds and say what we want. Um, yeah, similarly, like I I grew up just with a love of all things racing, all things fast cars. I am not uh, the person who can sit on the, the sidelines for anything. If I watch it and I like it, I have to go and do it. And it's not enjoyable to me unless I'm doing it. And so my racing background is, yeah, not many sanctioned races. Uh, let's say it that way. I was an announcer at a racetrack, but uh, yeah, most of my racing takes place off the grid on motorcycles and you know right. cheap, fast Hondas in the early 2000s. Kind of fell in love with it through that and that era. That was when I was coming up. Um, quickly realized that for a set of tires for my race car i could buy a simulating setup and spend a lot more time behind the wheel and do it in a more cost effective manner so that's where i i invest a lot of my time i actually played for like an hour and a half before we got on the show uh but that's i fun. i dts came out and and yeah it, it brought me back to f1 but i did grow up watching schumacher and andretti um waking up early in the mornings and, and watching it on TV. And I, I was an early riser as a kid. So I would, I would wake up on Sunday mornings and several times my mom would have to come out of her room and tell me to turn the damn TV down. So I'd yeah. watch it with it off on subtitles. And right. yeah, I, I just loved it. Nobody else in my family is this way. Uh, even my own daughter, we went to Disney world and we did the race car ride. And she said she would, she don't think, she would ever be in a real race car on a racetrack kind of broke my heart a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, she's her own person. So I'll, I'll let her do what she wants. I just want her to do what I want. Um, right. but no, I, I profound love of racing and then friends of mine too. Like I, I enjoy the technical aspect as much as my friends do. And so like these guys that go and design F1 cars have aerospace engineering degrees they are the pinnacle of engineering. And so pushing forward and in, in bounding technology forward is always something that I'm interested in. And I, I love that, that F1 does that. And you do get to see things like hybrid system techniques and regenerative braking, um, like come into commercial vehicles. Uh, mm -hmm. So all of that excites me, ignites my love for the sport. And just like you're saying, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes with personalities and drivers and team principals and who can put the upgrades in now we're we're in a good era right now right like it is so. awesome to see mclaren pushing up on red bull and we're i i don't think we're gonna see another like decades long era of dominance the way that we saw with schumacher and lewis and I think that that's why all of us are engaged in this sport beyond, you know, just our childhood, like affinity of racing and lifelong love of racing. It's like we love the competition the most and love seeing where this is going to go. The unpredictability of this is what makes it the most exciting and would also make it the most boring if it was predictable. And that's where you, right. they, I think F1 lost a lot of fans. Uh, it doesn't excuse the FIA and their malfeasance, in my opinion, but. 
uh, they try to keep things interesting too. All right, gents, we're, let's go ahead and wrap, but we're going to do top five drivers on the grid right now. I'll go ahead and start my top five drivers on the grid right now. I've got Max Verstappen in first. I don't think that there's a single driver on the grid right now that can take an inferior car above a superior car uh, any better than Max Verstappen. Even Lewis, with all of his experience, he needs a car that's like he would need McLaren's car to beat Max. Um, and, and that's just the way I call it. Second on the grid, based on their performance this year, and I'm talking about current performance, I'm going Lando Norris. Uh, hard to argue. Uh, he does get the benefit of being sort of the team lead down there at McLaren. Uh, and that's why my third driver is a very, very close behind him and almost dead even if I could pick two number twos it would be Oscar Piastri uh, Oscar is if he plays his cars right man he he stands to have a very long successful career in F1 I think a team change would be something that's inevitable for him down the road if he wants to be a number one driver on a team uh, and in my opinion he is proving himself week in week out uh, you guys agree that like you're um closest competition is your teammate and Oscar is the consummate teammate. One of the things that I like about him the most is his attitude and the way that he approaches things. Even as that number two driver, he's willing to subordinate himself for the benefit of the team. And that's what leads you in my opinion to being signed by a top tier team. Your, your teamwork and your followership skills will elevate you. That's why I'm so much of a harsh critic towards Esteban Ocon because he does not possess any of those followership skills or teamwork ability. It, and it's especially when you're trying to search for a contract and a way to stay on the grid his his piss poor attitude is, is doing him no favors. Um, George Russell is my fourth. Uh, just motivation, pure drive. He's, he's got it when Lewis doesn't. Uh, and then fifth, I go, I'm going Lewis just, just perfect. I mean, career and everything that he's got, but he has to have this kind of drive motivation. It's got to be extra. We're seeing that taper off a lot at the end of his career. And I, I will not like shy away from calling him a prima donna. He's only best when he's in the best car. He demands the best car. And if he doesn't get it, his attitude suffers, his attitude towards his team suffers. And, you know, 2022 was not a good look or a good year for him, uh, in my opinion. So, like, it it showed that, like, his personal frustrations impacted his performance at a level that we had never seen. And uh, it draw, like, drew him back, and that, that was why he didn't win, you know, on, honestly, in my opinion. So, I'll go ahead and concede, and let's go, Jay, what, who are your top five? That that's simple. Max for the absolute reasons that we've talked about. Plus, right. like I've said in the past, that man manhandles that car. That is not Vettel where he's making love to the car or Lewis where he's respecting the hell out of it. No, Max is making that car his bitch and holding it by the reins. Absolutely hands down. Second, I'm going to go with Nico Hulkenberg. He is okay. driving the damn wheels off of that Haas. I think there's only been, what, two races this year, one of which was not his fault that he didn't hit the points. That's uh, that's Checo's fault and Magnuson's. Um, you can't really hold that one against him too, too meanly there. Uh, Yuki Sonoda, another driver who is literally driving the absolute wheels off of that car. Carlos Sainz is out to prove absolutely everybody wrong that you are making a mistake by dropping me for Lewis Hamilton. You are losing someone who's been a team player. You are losing someone who has picked up the slack where it has been needed to be picked up for someone who is now going to compete against your franchise driver. And if, like, we've talked about this in the past, Chucky is not backing down. Guaranteed, you will see wheel-to-wheel -wheel 
constantly between him and Lewis. And that's why I don't think he'll get his eighth title in a Ferrari. And then finally, I'm going to say Lando, just because there has been so much come up in that boy this year. Like he's actually putting everything together. He's doing everything right. He's losing the, his say right attitude though. I will say before or last year, year before last, he was always like, you know, the team had a great time, this, that, and the other. Now it's, well, the team kind of fucked up, but, you know, I didn't do anything wrong. I just didn't have the team behind me today. Meanwhile, you miss your mark by two, or uh, you miss, uh, miss your box by two feet. You're going to have those problems, just like Max did in Austria. Um, but I think a lot of that will balance out once he realizes he's doing it and starts losing a little bit more of his popularity that he currently has. So that's a good list. Good, sir. That's a good list. So I had, I had the number, the, the names immediately once we said we were going to do this. And then I thought about, you know, how do I rank them and then justify the rankings? Right. So I'm going to flip it a little bit and say first Lewis. And the reason why I'm going to say Lewis is because at the start of the season, the car wasn't there in many ways. The seat wasn't in the right position. There was all kinds of issues with, with, with the car, you know, you name it. And yet he still managed to stay up in that P5, P6, and above area, regardless of that, okay? Um, and then, of course, top piling on all of the history and, and the whole nine yards, you know, not using the term GOAT, but saying here's a guy that has been now almost, he's in his 18th year of driving, and he's still doing this with a degree of finesse and dignity and class that other drivers should aspire to when it comes to just composure and all that. Max, for all the reasons we stated, um, pound for pound on sheer physical, mental, talent, ability, the way he reads a track, um, you know, it's, it's a glorious thing to see, um, especially when he's not turning it into NASCAR roller derby, you know? The beautiful thing I like about Formula One is that it is a sport of great dignity and finesse. That's the beauty of it. The beauty of it is the sleek, stealthy, you know, wax blown looking cars that cut through the atmosphere with, you know, precision and skill. And for these guys to be able to do that, taking five and six G's at a time, and sometimes 56 if they're slapping into a wall like poor Grosjean did, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of risk. There's a lot going on there. And for them to make it look as beautiful as they can make it look and do it for the benefit of the fans, the Max Verstappens of, of the world are like golden, okay? Um, the next one would be Oscar. I put him next. Oscar is the Michael Corleone of Formula One. He is on the come up. He is the dark horse, man. That dude, what, what, I, what I notice when I watch him race is how he pushes Lando to be better. If you look at this last race, when, that, when he overtook Lando, you just look at the way the driving is taking place, the way that they as teammates can push each other but not hurt each other is amazing. And that's part of Oscar's skill and his ability. You know, and he's just getting better race to race. The more comfortable he gets, the better he gets. And I think he's going to be a guy that can, can win a world championship. I really, really do. And I believe he could possibly do it before even Lando does. So he's my number, my number three. And then um, my number four, excuse me. And then you've got um, signs for sure. You know, um, signs coming in post appendix, you know, <laughs> winning a Grand Prix showed true grit, determination, skill, ability. The car wasn't necessarily perfect, but he knew what he needed to do to get in there and get it done and put his, his, his wax stamp on. That was a mistake, like you said. He put his wax stamp right, hey, hello. Um, and I, I, I didn't give you my, my fifth. And, and, then, and then Lando. I think Lando, Lando has a lot of gifts. I think Lando's biggest problem is mental. I think 
Lando has the physical tools. He's got the car. But Lando, I, I think, gets overwhelmed in his own personal battles in his head, and it translates into micro mistakes on the track that are costing him. But when it comes to, you know, out of the 20 drivers, I think that's the top five for me. Man, I love it. Uh, great, great, yeah, great analysis. Uh, very well justified. One thing I like just off the bat before we get into Greg, uh, I like that our our drivers are all different and for different reasons. Uh, we all kind of agreed on Max, right? But I like that you had Lewis as your number one in, in the justification for why. We're going to get into Greg and our future karting champ with him. Uh, <laughs> Greg, yeah, come on in, buddy. Uh, introduce us to our, our fifth co-host. So this is this is Kepler, named after Johannes Kepler. We just okay. like space or something. And uh, when we, we were in the NICU with him, we had signs put up. Uh, I wish I could get it off the wall. Let me see if I can, I can rescue it here. Yeah, there we go. So, you know, all the kids in NICU have their own, like, bay that they are, they're in, right? So this was his 2040 F1 World Championship. Kepler Sharp, and he was born on 7-Eleven, so naturally he was sponsored by 7-Eleven, the, the store brand. And I went and got, like, hats and stuff for all the nurses. It was, it was a good time. So I like it. Other than being in the NICU, yeah. That's so awesome. Anyway, my top five. All right, my top five. Um, I'm going to start down the bottom. I'm going to say that um, Piastri is actually better than Norris. And maybe for the reason I walked in on, maybe Norris has, like, a little bit of mo emotion going on. And no offense to Norris. Like, you know, son of a billionaire. He's done right by himself. He seems like a really well-adjusted person. And good for him for having passion. But I think Piastri has something that we haven't seen yet because the man hasn't spoken. We don't even know what's think is going on in his mind. Um, and that cool, calm, collectedness reminds me of the great that just left. And as soon as he stepped off the grid, everybody admitted, yeah, Kimi was the GOAT. And we're all like, oh, shnikes. Like, I recognize that he was great. But when you have all the other people on the grid going, yeah, Kimi was the best. But correct me if I'm wrong. This conversation is about the current drivers on the current grid, right? Okay, yes. so I'm going to say that if, if Norris is my five, then Piastri is my four, okay. right? Um, I'm going to put Max and Lewis over him, because over both of them, because their experience base goes well, well beyond. I think Max and Lewis are two completely different drivers. They're both obviously very good at what they do. Um, I want to see more from Max, like we were talking about with the whole time debate, like greatest of all time requires the time. Yep. Right now, you know, Max is like a James Hunt. You're like, holy crap, this guy's really good. But will he be good in all conditions? And you saw he wasn't winning championships when he didn't have the best car and the best engine. So like many of these debates, well, what does it take to win the championship? And I think we're going to see in the new era of budget caps and whatnot, there's going to be these people that, that go the distance. And I think, unfortunately, Leclerc is on a downstroke. I think he needs to be in that conversation somewhere because – when he came up under Vettel as the quote-unquote new rookie number two, I was shocked because I just assumed Vettel was up against this brick wall of Ferrari and Leclerc came in and was like, oh, no, I can go faster than you. We we're like, what the hell? So as much as I would like to include everybody in that conversation, like the signs and whatnot of the world, I think signs is a, a developing talent. Um, I don't think, uh, yeah, for whatever reason, I don't think he's done yet. I think signs has more to grow. You give him the right team and the right car around him, and I think we'll see more from signs. But if I had to do top five, I would go Norris Piastri and then, you know, probably Leclerc on, on right above them and Max and Lewis up at the top. And, and we'll see. We'll see what happens because for sure, Lewis has been shown to be good under pressure. Max is a robot. Like, that's strange how good he is in most all conditions. But he's done it with that one team and in that one car philosophy. And I'm like, cool, awesome. Give that credit where it's due. But yeah, so sorry I had to go, I had to go rescue this guy from daycare. That's awesome. There's only so much they can take. So Greg was the only one that had Leclerc, right? Yeah. Got it. I if I could have done top six, I would have put Alonzo in there. So if oh. like who's your honorable mention? We'll, we'll wrap on honorable mentions. So, like, Alonzo is I my will, honorable mention. The yeah, man that took down Schumacher. It, it, it's, Tell me what he's you at think the of tail me. end of a 20-plus year career. Um, yeah. And just that alone, like, it is significant. It's historical in, in its own right. And, and, man, is he a good, good driver. Mm -hmm. I think it's just way too, 
way too hard to maintain that mindset, that mentality 10 months out of the year for 20 years plus, And then at the tail end, like keep it going. Like, I don't know what's motivating him. No, you're wrong. I don't know. Lewis Lewis has an Lewis has an axe to grind. Alonzo is is already so is Alonzo. He's not not looking to win a championship. He's seriously, he's not like getting ready. He's not rich. You're (laughs) wrong, and here's why. What's hard for Alonzo is that he made the worst team jump decisions in the history, and he's still trying, right? Like Give the man a on good a, team and see what he can do. I guess, That's and right. and maybe he, maybe I maybe you're right, but like halfway through the season, he knows he's not going to win every single yeah. year. Oh yeah. So yeah. like again, like the motivation tapers off. Like uh, so, sure. yes, you're right. He wouldn't still he's be still doing it if he didn't have an axe to grind. You, I do think though, there's a, a bit of a touch of fear of like kind of like guys in the military where like you can't let it go. Because, like, sure. what else is he going to do? If he retires, like, what does he do? Like, this is I mean, he's he's been been for two decades. Hear me Wreck out, though. It's like the celebrity series this, for F1 drivers. It's like, when I'm done, I'm just going to go hang out I, at Le Mans once a year. <laughs> he can lurk over Shell's totally shoulder on a scooter, as far as I'm concerned. I would pay yeah. to watch that. <laughs> right? Like, so Alonzo's that's, good in ways that are But it's not uncanny. enough. It's, yeah, not, a, it's, good it's not enough. It's not enough. Hear me out. Like it's not enough for him. Like it, to step away from F one. Like that dramatic change in lifestyle. Like it's sure. going to generate like It'd depression. Cool. This is all. This It'd is be- him. This is who right. and how he is. He is a Formula One driver. To walk yeah. away from that, as grueling as the lifestyle it is, could. you you end up missing it more than yeah. you would ever imagine. And I think, but he that's knows not why that. I like, think he's I, an this is my personality. I have to walk away from. Yeah who and how I am and how I've been for the last 20 years. I give him honorable mention because of the different ways he's tried to drive all these awful cars that he's had. Like if you watch him in like the days after, well, we're no, like when the, the whole thing went down in 2008, watch how he drove those, drove yeah. those cars. Like he's on different lines. He's like using different strategies and he's chill with it. He's like, yep, that didn't work. We're gonna try something different next time. He's cool with it. Right. In ways that are creative and mm-hmm. you don't see that ever. People just drive the same line over and over again until it rains. And some of the smart people drive different lines. Lonzo was always on different lines. I saw him come off a corner, like out of the camera shot. The cameraman didn't even know where he was going next. I was like, what is this guy doing? And it was because his car didn't have whatever, didn't have drive off the corner, didn't have top speed. He was making new variables for himself. And that's, I give him a ton of credit for that, but he sucks at picking teams. Like awful. Yeah, no, I I don't want to take anything away from him other than, yeah, like he's, he's terrible at, at picking his team. Jay, who's your honorable mention? It's Alonzo, but for similar reasons to Greg. Because if you remember whenever Russell was screaming red flag, red flag, red flag, and Alonzo got blamed for it. Alonzo literally was taking different routes throughout, and he got nailed for it. And you know what he does? He keeps doing it. He's like, no, I'm not changing. I am looking for the absolute best line possible. Screw you if you don't like it. Simple. You're on my Christmas card list. Yes. Um... But no, Fernando Alonso, definitely, without a doubt. That man has done so much with shit cars. I feel horrible for him. I'm hoping that Adrian Newey goes there just so Alonso can at least win one more race um, at the very minimum. So that's kind of where I'm at with it. But definitely Alonso. He's always one to push. He's always just happy to be there, too. Like... You could tell he still loves every second of it. And I think that's part of why I left Lewis off of my list because the, the past two years, he's looked downright miserable. Like, I get that hit from Abu Dhabi. I understand. Your favorite driver looks miserable when he wins. Get out of here with your miserable face thing. Yuki? Yuki's never won. No, Max. His face looks like he you, just you got see what I deal with, I mean, I mean, it probably did, but that's besides the point. I mean, Max is the epitome of why child abuse works, apparently. Um, (laughs) But regardless, so, no, like, Alonzo just wants to be there. He's happy. He wants to be part of a team. He wants to be doing these things. And in all honesty, he has a fucking ambassador role now. I don't think he gives a shit anymore. 
I think he is happy with where he's at. He's got his ambassador role for life now. Congratulations. Welcome to the Nikki Lauda Club. Um, and he's just going to chill, like, realistically. He's going to do some WC events. I know him Max, him and Max were talking about doing Le Mans. Uh, and they want to get Yuki so they can lighten the car enough to make it go real fast. Because um, <laughs> they need a chaperone. So, for the overnight. Yeah, no, definitely. Can I go Alonso. sleep over at Uncle Alonzo's house in July right. or June in, in France? Okay. <laughs> but that's a good one. That's a good honorable mention. So two Alonzos. All right. Three. Three Alonzos. That's the first time we've well, ever really agreed on anything. Well, then I have to upset the apple cart. So my honorable mention is going to be Russell. And hmm. and I'll and I'll candidly because he wasn't in my top five. Okay. Um so Russell, it, it's definitely Russell. Russell, I'm I'm still getting to know Russell, right? Like, you know, I think everyone is actually still really getting to know Russell. Because yeah. until once he, he gets outside of puberty, you'll know him better. Exactly. You know, and, and once he has another like a, another win or so, you'll start mm -hmm. to really probably see who he really is. And truthfully, it's next year, I think, is when we're going to – Russell will come into whatever his own persona really is going to be in F1 when he's with this other teammate, this undetermined teammate, yeah. right? Yeah. And that will have a big impact on where that goes. But all things considered, when you look at, you know, the Mercedes team, you know, Russell outperforming Lewis for a long period of time – um, you look at the win yesterday, you look at who's the first person at the car. Mm -hmm. It's Russell. That spoke volumes to me. You know, so he's a guy who can win. He does drive well. Okay. He's a guy that can win. You know, his personality is a little weird and quirky. You know, I, I was listening to uh, the Red Flags guys talk about him saying yabba dabba do, you know, and how funny that was because he's so young. Like, where the hell did he come up with yabba dabba do, right? Like, what kind of, who is he that he knows this, you know? So it's really interesting. But, um, yeah, I, I, I've been real impressed with the way, like, when I watch him and Lewis battle, it's very similar to me in the way that Piastri and Norris battle. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they have an ability to push each other to be better without so making not it. Ocon and Gasly is what you're getting at. No, I mean, it, it, exactly. And, you know, and I think back even, and I don't, I'm not trying to, you know, bash Stappen, but I think back to when, you know, Verstappen and Ricardo had the, 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 the rear end thing happen. And, you know, it was like, Oh my God, like, where did that come from? You know, like what's going on? Why would you even, be in that situation. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I don't see Piastri and Norris kind of doing that to themselves. Yeah. I don't see right. Russell and Hamilton doing it. And I respect that. I think that that is really cool that they know how to get it to the knife's edge, but not cut really. Yeah. There's a lot of maturity in that team, which is, yeah. you know, expected on one side of it. Right. So I will counteract the Max because I believe George and Lewis took them to each other out last year, uh -huh. if I'm not mistaken. Uh -huh. But the Max thing, he was 19 years old whenever that happened. He should not have had a super license at that point. And that is my biggest <laughs> point of contention with Antonelli this and Behrman coming Second out or third fail. year of being an F1 at that point. Yeah, like, honestly, I don't think anyone under the age of 21 should be an F1, period. Because damn it, Jay, stop agreeing th things in my head. Yeah, that's and I mean also that's, a, that's an interesting point. Everybody's saying about how George is still young. I mean, yeah, he's young, he's 26, but he's also 26, which isn't really saying much either which way on that. You know, mm -hmm. like he's old enough to know better, but still young enough to not do what he should. Perfect mm -hmm. example is um which race did Signs win earlier this year, Australia? Whenever he wrecked? Yeah. Yeah, like, George is infamous for that. Like, he did it in Singapore last year. He did it this year. Like, and they're stupid mistakes. And that's the biggest reason why I have to leave George Russell out of any conversation right now. Is a developing still, talent. Yes, he's a developing talent. And he's Agreed. making very much little tiny stupid mistakes that he shouldn't be making at that point in his career. 
because he did spend three years down at Williams. Mm -hmm. Um, Trey, the reason why we're saying age matters is you don't have the maturity levels to not ram your front end up your teammate's ass end, basically. Um, or try to go wheel to wheel with Lewis Hamilton. Hey, Albon, how's those concussions doing? You know, like, I uh, mean, you're, you're harsh, man. <laughs> really? Sand, sand trap there. This is soft. Which time? He hit him out like three times. The one my Albon favorite was when Albon goes around the outside of the ring and Lewis was like, I'm driving a dump truck, you know, just wee. Uh, and it's like, blasted well, him into the. It, it, I yeah. saw it coming a mile away, but apparently Albon didn't. He was like, ah, what could go wrong? But yeah, no, I mean, a lot of the drivers on the grid are young still. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's kind of kind of telling whenever, who is it? Alonzo and Lewis are the two old men of the grid, and they're one of them's younger than me. You know, it's it's wild, like to even be in that consideration. So, mm -hmm. oh wow, I didn't know Stroll was only twenty five. That makes a little bit more sense now. Yeah, Chewy, why does he look like he's forty? Then that is that is wild. he really does look like he's forty, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Seeing him uh, candidly it, behind the scenes and like uh, DTS is super awkward. Stroll's always like, huh, you know what, guys? But dude, stop speaking. Like, you're just, he's kind of a dork. He's like, kind of like a, a walking, talking Muppet. He's like almost like Oscar yeah. the Grouch and you know, <laughs> popping out of a trash can, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry. He reminds me of just like, like old school British class royalty where they like didn't get taught how to read because they didn't yeah. need to. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, he. Yeah. It wasn't like he was some supreme academic. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he's got I don't know, like a graduate degree from Cambridge. But judging by his method of speaking, probably not. I honestly don't know his educational <laughs> background. But he comes off as the dumbest person I've ever heard speak. Uh, in, in a over place and in again. a sport where, like, where like it really is sort of demanding of you to maintain a public persona that yes. he just doesn't have to worry about because I, that is the advantage he gets from daddy's money. Uh, he may he, have like, he does not need to worry. He may have like some sort of like calm version of ADHD where like, he just doesn't bother to concentrate sometimes. Like he's not distracted. He's just not concentrating because when he does concentrate, dude can drive. Like he's got podiums and like, you've seen him do great wet weather driving, which requires actually paying attention. <laughs> but then other times he's like, is that Ricciardo? Wham! That was Ricciardo. What was he doing in my way? You're like, what are you doing, bro? Like, pay attention. Like, we're all slow. He's the worst. He's like, I was looking over there. Go, go on, folks. He's the watch worst. The video worst one at driving in a pack. The one, video I posted of Vettel and him uh, drifting. It's hilarious. So it's what a drifting to? competition. So Vettel's yeah. drifting like a boss. Like he comes right out of Japan, you know, and he's the drift champion of the world. And mm -hmm. and. Uh, and Stroll is making the car drift, but he's definitely not keeping it going where it's supposed to be going or on track. He's just kind of having fun with the idea that, oh, it drifted, and now I need to start over again. <laughs> it's, so, it's hilarious. It's pretty typical, pretty typical in, yeah, like in telling of how he yeah, is on track. Exactly. Uh, yeah, there, there is that element where like he has his parachute strapped firmly to his back and he never has to worry about anything at all um he has a lot of faith in the many hero. other guys yeah many many other yeah. guys uh <laughs> that are on this grid know that they have to fight in battle for their contract right um yeah all right gents we're 225 we've got about five minutes left what do you what do you want to talk about last fabian i'm going to have let you suggest a topic for the four of us to cover for the last five minutes Let's talk about no pressure. The concept of abandoning DRS zones for X and Z mode, and how that's going to work because they allege that the, the whole purpose of this new approach is to allow cars to enter turns still fighting for position because there's less turbulent air for creating more drag. And so we just saw some of the best DRS moments in mm -hmm. F1 history yesterday. And then you're going, okay, 
So in two, you know, two years from now, we're not going to see that anymore. But how is that really going to work? Have you guys read those regs and watched the videos and analyzed all this stuff? I'm sure you have, because how can you not, right? I mean, it's like, as soon as they put it out, I must have watched the video like 10 times and then, you know, I had to go pull the documents. But what do you think about how that's really going to play out? Do you think they're actually going to make it so that these teams will be a lot closer to one another and be able to really dogfight it out in the corners? No, I think it's going to make things worse. I think it's, it's like without the manual input from a driver, I think it like is a, a safety issue. One thing where, you know, Jay corrects me on and I immediately walk it back and agree with him is whenever it's a safety issue and I don't like massive changes in aerodynamics out of the hands of a driver. That's just not mm. not something I ever want to see. So uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Jay from there, though. If you're ready. So, yeah. So if you'll have us, Jay. Uh, I don't think the new regs with taking away DRS is a good plan. Uh, a lot of it is, if I remember reading it correctly, it's programs that are going to be operating the new DRS and essentially taking it out of driver's hands and it's going to be full active or, uh, yeah, full active. Um, we've seen where this can go wrong in the past. Uh, I can't remember the name of the driver, but it was like 2016, 2017, where the DRS got stuck open and he ended up doing the loop-de-loop down the road for at least four five different uh, rollovers. I think there's too much room for error in it. I really do. I think you're also taking huge amounts of skill out of it. Just like whenever they switched over from uh, clutch and paddle to just paddle, you're, mm -hmm. you're really taking away. And I mean, I know that's one of Lewis Hamilton's biggest complaints is, and Max's at that, is that you're, you're literally taking what it means to be a driver and you're just throwing it out the window. Like mm -hmm. it's getting to the point now where if you can react quickly, then you can do F1, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, where do you go from here? Where is that happy medium? Because I get where people are sick of DRS trains. I'm personally sick of them seeing a pack get backed up by what? 10 different cars and just sit there and nothing changes because everybody has DRS. Uh, you're starting to see it break away a little bit more as these cars are getting a lot more dirty air pushing out where DRS isn't as effective at all tracks versus now it's like, okay, there's some tracks where it's still really good. And then there's tracks where it's borderline useless. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll be interesting to see where they go from there. I think mm -hmm. them stepping away from arrow regs altogether the way they are is kind of stupid in all honesty because you've see, you're now seeing some of the best racing for this year and more than likely next year in favor of switching out going to zero air well not zero arrow but reducing arrow a lot and increasing dependency on energy and uh, energy and engine so what are you going to do there you're going to create another 2014 to 2021 all over again realistically so no. i don't know what they're trying to do at this point like are you just trying to say the only thing that matters is the engines or are you saying that it's a whole team concept where the car design matters the arrow matters the uh driver matters the engine matters like absolutely everything currently matters in it because you could have the best aerodynamics package in the world but have an absolute shit show of an engine and not be able to do anything. Yeah. So it's it's definitely a careful balance that I think they're trying to do, but I think they they may have screwed this one up and they even tried to walk it back and Toto Wolf was like, no, you're not. That ain't happening. <laughs> These are the regs. This is what we're doing. Yeah. So it'll definitely it's be something that we can definitely dig into whenever you guys want to circle back to it in weeks coming if you want to have that conversation it looks like they're turning the cars into shapeshifters and the drivers into bronco, bronco busters like they got to know how to what comes out the gate because the car's going to be changing itself a lot on track and then there's a mode that they do get to control but anyway interesting stuff 
Yeah. I, I'm going to withhold bad notions about it because I think when the regs came out for this current one, we were like, oh, hold on a second. Ground effects was killing people years ago. They, they got it right. Even though Toto was like, this is totally BS. And, you know, Horner was like, fix your car. And Toto was like, stop sending pictures of your wiener. You know, anyway. I, pr- I have the email. Withhold. It's right here. So – I think it's it's going to turn out reasonable. Um, they obviously have a little bit of adjustment they can do with the motor and battery deployment. And that was, that's yeah. my big thing. Like, hey, let's give them more opportunity to mechanically go faster because there are some tracks like Monaco. Arrow is not – DRS doesn't do much there, right? Like, you need to blast by someone, not slingshot by them. So I give a thumbs up to the, the regulations. I'm happy to see where they go and what happens. And, um, yeah, that's it. Boom. Gents, uh, great marathon of an episode. Uh, Greg, you called it right. Well, so another addition to the segment of We Were Right, we could yeah. easily talk for two hours. Easy two hours. And more. <laughs> Unscripted. Easily. Fabian, thanks for coming on, impromptu guest. Uh, we are Thank still going to have you on you next guys. week. Absolutely. Really, really uh, loved all of your there. inputs. Appreciate you fit it. right in. Thanks. Yeah, we'll, we'll have you on next week. And uh, – yeah, we'll Sounds probably great. try to shoot for two hours next week if we can, even on an off weekend, because I think we're going to have more than enough content to produce. But yeah, once again, to anybody <laughs> and everybody who's been listening to us, uh, thank you. This has been the Pit Stop Podcast, uh, and yeah, we love having you, and thank you to mbrradio.us. Thanks, guys. Take care. <laughs>